Ancient Anunnaki and the Babylonian Empire How the Sumerians' Legends Descended to the Reign of Nebuchadnezzar Written by Farouk Zamani The majority of our knowledge about Babylon has come from excavations conducted by the Deutsch Orient Gesellschaft between 1899 and 1917. It has been challenging to explore Babylon's early history due to the high water table. Excavations concentrated on the later phases of occupation, mainly Nebuchadnezzar II's 604-562 BC reconstruction of the city centre in the 6th century BC. Several older monuments, including the famous Code of Hammurabi, were actually found in the Iranian city of Susa. These treasures were looted from Babylon and carried there in antiquity by the Elamite king Shutruk Nahunte, circa 1185-1155 BC, in the 12th century BC. Moreover, the cult statues of Marduk, the city's chief god, and his consort, Zarpanitu, were among the booty from the same invasion. His name was derived from an illustrious predecessor who at the end of the 12th century BC recovered Babylon's honour and prosperity when he recovered the statues. Ancient Babylonia As Mesopotamia developed into a polity of more considerable powers during the 3rd millennium BC, there were no longer city-states, but larger states, even empires. During the later centuries of the 3rd millennium, Archaeologists have been unable to determine the exact location of Akkad, a city in southern Iraq, whose precise location has not yet been determined, Ur. And finally, the rival powers of Isin and Lhasa ruled multiple towns in the south. It is believed that the rise of Babylon to a position of central political importance dates back to Hammurabi's reign, 1790-1752 BC, the most famous king of an Amorite dynasty based on their likely tribal origins, who ruled from the early 19th century BC. Following a period of territorial competition in which the cities of Isin and Lhasa had dominated, Babylon gained the upper hand, first as the leader of a coalition, then as the sole ruler. By the end of Hammurabi's reign in the mid-18th century BC, Babylon had established hegemony over southern Iraq, and a significant area to the north. The urban literate Mesopotamian world had been around for over a millennium by this time, as had the civic institutions. Hammurabi's modern title of lawgiver, which he has been given since then, does not quite do him justice. Instead, his political and military successes make him the most crucial figure. The conquest of Lhasa allowed him to claim the title of King of Sumer and Akkad, i.e. southern Iraq as well, which was followed by the conquest of Mari to the north and eventually of Ashur and Nineveh. The earliest history of Babylon is little known. Among the many cities flourishing in southern Iraq, the town first appears in texts in the 3rd millennium BC. Until the last century of the 3rd millennium, few references existed to Babylon. However, offerings made to the temple of Enlil in Nippur during this period, when Babylon was part of an empire ruled by Ur, suggest a city already of some size and wealth. From relative obscurity in the middle of the 18th century BC, Babylon emerged as the political centre of southern Mesopotamia. It held this position almost continuously for the next 1,400 years. Near Baghdad, around 85 kilometers south of the Euphrates, is the site of Babylon. The area is located north of the great alluvial plain of southern Iraq, a landscape of silts deposited by the Tigris and Euphrates into a vast rift created by tectonic movement as the Arabian plate slips beneath the neighboring Eurasian plate. In addition to defining modern-day Iraq's northern and eastern boundaries, the Taurus and Zagros mountain ranges were created by the same collision. As a result, Mesopotamia encompasses several environmental zones, but Babylon itself is found in the flat alluvial plain in southern Iraq. In addition to containing one of the world's earliest cities, the table is subject to several significant environmental constraints that have shaped human settlements since long before the foundation of Babylon. 
rain-fed agriculture is beyond the reach of this area due to its high temperatures. Despite the little precipitation this part of Iraq receives, it is uneven and unreliable. The bulk of a season's rain can fall in a single downpour, damaging crops as severe droughts, for human habitation is dependent on the two great rivers, and the permanent settlement requires irrigation. Upon establishment, however, on the levees of canals, such a system could benefit from the rich alluvial soils and support highly productive agriculture. In explaining the region's early urbanisation and accompanying economic development, Many contend that the region's ability to produce large agricultural surpluses played a significant role, though in what way is hotly contested. Herodotus was undoubtedly impressed. As a grain-bearing country, Assyria, meaning Mesopotamia, is the richest globally. He writes in his description of the 5th century BC, figs, grapes, olives or other fruit trees are not grown there but the grain fields tend to produce crops 200-fold and 300-fold in exceptional years. At least three inches wide are the wheat and barley blades. Millet and sesame grow to an astonishing size, as I know. But those who have not visited Babylon have refused to believe even what I have already described as its fertility. Sesame oil is the only oil they use, and date palms, most of which bear fruit, provide them with food, wine and honey. It was necessary to constantly maintain the infrastructure that facilitated such abundance, including the irrigation system and the parallel drainage system, since water can also bring salt to the surface through capillary action, making the land too saline for agriculture. Water control was an essential source of power and conflict during the ancient world, just as it is today, as Iraq and its upstream neighbours Turkey and Syria struggle with competing water demands. Although labour organisation requirements resulting from this need may not have been the primary driving force behind the earliest urbanisation during the 4th millennium BC, where canal systems were relatively modest, by the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, a large amount of labour was required to maintain significant canal systems. This very flat area is also subject to natural or artificial changes in river courses. Similarly, Massive engineering projects to change watercourses figure prominently in ancient Greek stories about Babylon, where watercourse changes are an essential military strategy. The majority of our knowledge about Babylon has come from excavations conducted by the Deutsch Orient Gesellschaft between 1899 and 1917. It has been challenging to explore Babylon's early history due to the high water table. Excavations concentrated on the later phases of occupation, mainly Nebuchadnezzar II's 604-562 BC reconstruction of the city centre in the 6th century BC. Several older monuments, including the famous Code of Hammurabi, were actually found in the Iranian city of Susa. These treasures were looted from Babylon and carried there in antiquity by the Elamite king, Shutruk Nahunte, circa 1185-1155 BC, in the 12th century BC. Moreover, the cult statues of Marduk, the city's chief god, and his consort, Zarpanitu, were among the booty from the same invasion. His name was derived from an illustrious predecessor, who at the end of the 12th century BC recovered Babylon's honour and prosperity when he recovered the statues. Ancient Babylonia as Mesopotamia developed into a polity of more considerable powers during the 3rd millennium BC, there were no longer city-states, but larger states, even empires. During the later centuries of the 3rd millennium, archaeologists have been unable to determine the exact location of Akkad, a city in southern Iraq, whose precise location has not yet been determined, Ur, and finally the rival powers of Isin and Lhasa, ruled multiple towns in the south. It is believed that the rise of Babylon to a position of central political importance dates back to Hammurabi's reign, 1790-1752 BC, the most famous king of an Amorite dynasty based on their likely tribal origins, 
who ruled from the early 19th century BC. Following a period of territorial competition in which the cities of Isin and Lhasa had dominated, Babylon gained the upper hand, first as the leader of a coalition, then as the sole ruler. By the end of Hammurabi's reign in the mid-18th century BC, Babylon had established hegemony over southern Iraq and a significant area to the north. The urban literate Mesopotamian world had been around for over a millennium by this time, as had the civic institutions. Hammurabi's modern title of lawgiver, which he has been given since then, does not quite do him justice. Instead, his political and military successes make him the most crucial figure. The conquest of Lhasa allowed him to claim the title of King of Sumer and Akkad, i.e. southern Iraq as well, which was followed by the conquest of Mari to the north, and eventually of Ashur and Nineveh. As Hammurabi established Babylon's superiority among the cities of southern Iraq, it was successfully defended. Although the so-called Sealand dynasty challenged it heavily in the south, the first dynasty of Babylon, rulers since the early 19th century BC, retained power and part of Hammurabi's territory until 1595 BC. As another and even more enduring legacy, Babylon remained the principal political centre of southern Mesopotamia, which from this point forward we can call Babylonia. Until the time of Seleucus I Nicator and the founding of Seleucia on the Tigris near the end of the 4th century BC, Babylon's rise to power as a powerful city has been the subject of legend, which is entirely appropriate. The Code of Hammurabi, popularly known as the world's first code of laws, is one of the most important and iconic objects in the Mesopotamian collection of the Musée du Louvre. If the laws are still the first cuneiform texts, studied by students of Assyriology, the study of ancient Mesopotamian languages and literature, there are older lists of laws that exist, but the number of laws and their presentation in such a striking public format gives the Code of Hammurabi a unique significance. Kassite Babylon Hammurabi's successors saw their fortunes wane over time until eventually the gradual weakening of Babylonian power allowed the Anatolian Hittite Empire to launch a brief but highly successful military raid on Mesopotamia and even Babylon itself, 1595 BC. After this incursion, the old Babylonian period ended and a more fragmented era began which, at least from a Babylonian perspective, was dominated by a dynasty of Kassite kings. At the end of the 18th century BC, the Kassites first appear in Mesopotamian texts. Nevertheless, they are only visible in Babylon's story by the 16th century. The people from the Zagros Mountains in Iran speak a non-Semitic language, unrelated to Babylonian. Kassite families are thought to have settled in Mesopotamia in increasing numbers, during the 17th century BC, while a Kassite kingdom bordering Babylon may have posed a military threat. However, the Hittites, under Mershali I, circa 1620 to 1595 BC, ended the first dynasty of Babylon. If not for the court intrigue in the Hittite capital of Hattusha and the assassination of Mershali shortly after the raid, the Hittite presence might have lasted a lot longer. As a result, the other neighbours battled over a desperately weakened Babylon. The Saarland kings of the south are thought to have held Babylon briefly in the 16th century BC, before the Kassites took control of the city and northern Mesopotamian plains. However, the evidence for the 16th century BC is highly sparse. It is also not clear at what point Kassite control was established based on a later document, indicates that during the reign of Kassite king Argum II, the statues of Marduk and the consort Zarpanitu were recovered from the Hittite capital, Hattusha, where they had been taken even before Moshili I's invasion, and returned to the great temple Esagila in Babylon circa 1570 BC. This act marked the beginning, if not the legitimation, of four centuries of Kassite rule. 
By the mid-15th century, the Kassites also controlled the southern region of Babylonia, previously held by the sea lands. Kassite settlements returned to a more rural pattern during the period. Archaeological survey data suggests that smaller payments became more common overall in southern Mesopotamia, while numbers of larger settlements declined. Kurik Alzu I, circa 1375 BC, carried monumental building projects in Babylon and other cities. Kassites was a large and prosperous state, but they never achieved international political or military dominance. During the latter half of the second millennium BC, other significant powers included the Hittite Empire in Turkey and Mitanni, a kingdom composed of small Hurrian states unified at around 1500 BC and covering much of Syria and northern Iraq at its height. Because of the incredible archive known as the Amarna Letters, the period has been described as an international age. Documents discovered in Akhetatan, the capital of Amarna, reveal the correspondence between Amenophis III and Akhenaten and Kassite kings at Babylon, written in Babylonian cuneiform. The kings of the eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East engaged in similar posts, along with gift exchange and intermarriage, in the 14th to 15th centuries BC, according to tablets from Iraq, Syria, the Levant, and Anatolia. Kuduras are large stone land grants inscribed with texts, religious motifs, and sometimes human figures, distinctively Kassite Babylonian artifacts. However, the iconography of these monuments is clearly Babylonian, and the inscriptions are written in Babylonian cuneiform. Kassite material and visual culture differ from the preceding Old Babylonian period, yet exhibit continuity with the earlier Mesopotamian world. Assimilation was a typical pattern in Babylon's history, where conquerors emulated or adapted Babylonian cultural forms, rather than trying to impose their own. Even if the reasons for this trend have varied over time, the trend certainly indicates the significance that Babylon held in terms of culture, religion and politics. The Elamite Community and Others Assyrian king, Tukulti Ninurta I, 1243-1207 BC, sacked Babylon during the reign of Kassite king Kashtiliashu IV, 1232-1225 BC. A substantial amount of destruction took place, at least according to Assyrian texts. It is said that Tukulti Ninurta I returned to Babylon, put to the sword. The Babylonians after one destroyed the wall of Babylon, Within the booty, Esagil and Babylon's properties were taken. Upon removing Marduk from his throne, he sent him to Assyria. Putting his governors in Karduniash, Babylon, was his decision. Karduniash was ruled by Tukulti Ninurta I for seven years. Assyria ruled Babylon for the first time. Sargon and Naram Sin, the first empire builders in ancient Mesopotamia, held titles such as King of Sumer and Akkad, and King of the Upper and Lower Seas, i.e. from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf. When Tukulti Ninurta described this event in his royal inscriptions, he might have been echoing the language of Akkadian kings. Amid the battle, King Katiliau declares, I captured Katiliau, king of the Kassites, just like a footstool. I took him captive and brought him to my lord. Since the lower sea borders my land on the east, I became lord over Sumer and Akkad. The Mediterranean and Middle Eastern worlds experienced instability and upheaval during Tukulti Ninurta's reign, and Babylonian power was weakened. Assyrian control was cut in Babylon due to Elamite interference, although Adad Shuma Usur, 1216 to 1187 BC, Meli Shipak, 1186 to 1172 BC, and Marduk Apla Edina, the first, 1171 to 1159 BC. Then, military pressure from Assyria and Elam ended the Kassite state, though. The Elamite king 
Shutruk Nahunte attacked the city in 1159 BC. His son was installed as king of Babylon during this time, and several Babylonian monuments were taken to the Elamite capital at Susa. Today, Hammurabi's code is the most famous of these, but much more deeply felt at the time was the loss of Marduk's statue. It was an ancient tradition in Mesopotamia to take a city's god, and the act had various meanings. Cult statues were naturally valuable objects, but that was just the beginning. Statues in ancient Iraq were much more than images. In a sense, they are still unclear today. It was as if they were gods themselves. The fact that a foreign army could kill the gods' statues in a city suggested that the city had been abandoned by the gods. Thus, the loss of cult statues was a humiliating and traumatic experience, and their recovery was a crucial civic honour, even centuries later. Babylon was ruled for several centuries by the descendants of more or less local dynasties. Although the dynasty never returned to power during the brief Elamite rule, the dynasty faced violent Kassite resistance. Under Nebuchadnezzar I, 1125 to 1104 BC, the second dynasty of Isin recovered the statue of Marduk from Susa after a successful military campaign, an event that had significant ramifications for Babylonian cultural identity. During the third millennium BC, Nebuchadnezzar's reinstallation of Marduk in Babylon represents the culmination of his rise from obscure origins to prominence. During this time, Enuma Elish first appeared in the Babylonian epic of creation which justified Marduk's, and thus Babylon's, preeminence by his heroic role in the conquest of chaos at the beginning of time. The Assyrian Empire Although Nebuchadnezzar I achieved incredibly, Babylonia did not gain long-term independence. The reign of Nebuchadnezzar was the most successful of the second dynasty of the Isin kings, and raids by Aramean tribal groups throughout his successors revealed the limits of Babylonian state power. Tiglath Pileser I, 1114-1076 BC, revived Assyrian fortunes, and by the first millennium BC, Babylon was once again weak politically and militarily. Assyria prospered under successive kings who developed their small state in northern Iraq, into one of the most powerful military powers in the region, with an empire covering much of the Middle East. Until the 8th century BC, Babylon remained independent. tiglath pileser III increasingly campaigned in the south following his accession in 745 BC, initially against Chaldean and Aramean tribal enemies. Upon the end of his rule in 727 BC, Babylonia was under the direct control of the Assyrians. Shalmaneser V's brief reign, 726-722 BC, and the rise to power of the usurper Sargon II, 721-705 BC, allowed Babylonia to assert its independence under Marduk Apla Edina II, the biblical Merodach Baladan, the ruler of the Chaldean Bit Yakin tribe, who installed himself as king of Babylon in 721 BC, maintaining Babylonia's independence until completely overthrown by Sargon in 710 BC. Babylonian rebels regularly faced Assyrian rule in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, Bit Dakuri, Bit Amukani, and Bit Yakin, were powerful Chaldean tribes whose territory spanned from Borsippa near Babylon south along the Euphrates to the Persian Gulf. Assyrian armies found the tribes to be quite mobile, possibly because they made the most of the landscape and environment than their more powerful opponents. Compared to their neighbours in the cities of northern Babylonia, they were less at risk from Assyrian campaigns. The Assyrian control over Babylonia was constantly threatened, especially by Sennacherib. Martuk Apla Edina briefly took control of Babylon following a revolt in 703 BC. After defeating the rebellion, Sennacherib installed Bel Ibni as Babylon's king, a Babylonian raised in the Assyrian court. 
Sennacherib was forced to fight a new campaign against Marduk Apla Edina due to the resistance, resulting in the removal of Bel Ibni from the throne and the installation of his son as king of Babylon, Ashur Nadin Shumi. Babylonia again rebelled against Assyria in 694 BC, triggered by an Elamite invasion of Babylonia itself. Nergal Ushezib took over Ashur Nadin Shumi's kingship after he was captured, apparently by Babylonian conspirators. Nergal Ushezib ruled for a short time. He was captured by the Assyrians in 693 BC and killed. Although Babylon was well defended, it had to endure a protracted siege. Mushebid Marduk continued the rebellion, but Assyria was militarily superior to Babylonia. Here is an example from a contemporary legal source. During Mushezib Marduk's reign, Babylonia was ravaged by siege, famine, hunger, want, and hard times. Everything had been destroyed. One shekel of silver was worth two qua of barley. There was no way out of the city, as all four gates were barred. In Babylon, the squares were filled with dead men without anyone to bury them. It remains unclear whether Babylon was taken by force or forced to surrender due to starvation in 689 BC. In the aftermath of Sennacherib's actions and the abolition of Babylon's independent kingship, it could be argued that Sennacherib's actions were measures of last resort, essential to the ending of a five-year war. Babylon held a special place in Mesopotamian culture, so attacks against the city were not taken casually. Despite this, Sennacherib's own texts emphasize the extent of the destruction. On cliff faces near the mouth of Sennacherib's irrigation canal for his capital at Nineveh, the Bavarian inscription is explicit. The city and its houses were all destroyed from foundation to parapet. They were devastated, burned. The outer and inner walls of the town, the temples and the ziggurat were razed, and their bricks and earthwork were discarded into the Aratu Canal. To prevent future generations from recognizing the site of the city's temples, I dissolved the area with water and made it look inundated land. My canals sliced through the center of the town. I filled it with water, eroded its foundations, and destroyed it more comprehensively than a devastating flood. Babylon's cultural and religious importance made its destruction all the more shocking, and both Babylonian and Assyrian historical texts later avoided the topic, at times attributing it to a flood brought on by the wrath of Marduk. Having failed to install a loyal vassal as king of Babylon, Sennacherib now ruled directly over the kingdom. This is the second time Marduk's statue has been moved, probably to Ashur. The Akitu Chronicle records that the New Year festival did not occur during the 20-year absence of the figure from Babylon. During the late 8th and early 7th centuries BC, Babylonia was depopulated in a broader sense. As a result of the deportations into the Assyrian heartland, there was less danger of dissent and rebellion and provisions for ambitious building programs at Nineveh and agricultural work elsewhere in the empire. Esarhaddon, the son and successor of Sennacherib, 681-669 BC, faced further rebellions, but also rebuilt Babylon after it had seemingly been abandoned for 11 years following Sennacherib's destruction. According to his inscriptions, the rebuilding of Babylon was accompanied by a resurgence of the piety and reverence for Babylon, traditionally expressed by Assyrian kings, and was only temporarily interrupted during Sennacherib's reign. According to various versions, the Assyrians assembled a massive group of workers drawn from Babylonia, Assyria, and or conquered lands, and Esser hadn't claimed to have personally participated in the project. The following is how Brinkman summarizes their content. In Esser Haddon's Babylon inscriptions, a focus is given to the divine framework within which Babylon became extinct and was resurrected. Malportant omina, the iniquitous conduct of the Babylonians, including misappropriation of temple funds, the destruction of the city by a severe flood, Marduk's decision to shorten the years of desolation from 70 to 11, auspicious omina, and restoration. 
The king of Babylon, however, was not installed by Caesar Haddon. Assyria and Babylonia were inherited by two of his sons, Ashurbanipal and Shamash Shuma Ukin. Ashurbanipal was to hold authority over both kingdoms, though this arrangement that did not separate the empire but sought to place the two brothers in a close but unequal relationship. Ashurbanipal, an Assyrian king, continued his father's work of rebuilding Babylon. He continued to expand and strengthen the Assyrian Empire during the 16 years of this dual monarchy. As recorded in Ashurbanipal's texts, the return of kingship via Shamash Shuma Ukin and the statue of Marduk, whether the original or a new one produced in Assyria, were causes for a grand celebration in Babylonia and Assyria. During Ashurbanipal's reign, Egypt to the west and Elam to the east were the most significant military threats. Assyrian campaigns against both powers were successful, and the empire's reach grew. As Shamash Shumaukin turned against his brother in 652 BC, the dual kingship system ended. This marked the beginning of the most severe Babylonian revolt against Assyria. Whether Ashbanipal overused his position as his brother's overlord, or Shamash Shumaukin believed he could stand against Syria militarily, with Elamite and tribal support, the result was a devastating war, ruinous for both kingdoms. Babylon was under siege for two years when it fell in 648 BC. Famine and disease once again accompanied the war, and other cities in Babylonia suffered. Even after Babylon was reconquered, the Assyrian army remained occupied for several more years in campaigns of retribution against Elam, the tribes of southern Mesopotamia, and the tribes of the western deserts. Although Assyria had beaten all its enemies by the end of seven years of fighting, the campaign exhausted even the most formidable military machines. No other Assyrian movements were recorded after Ashurbanipal's victory, but the struggle had drained the Assyrian Empire's resources, perhaps even precipitating its collapse. Shamash Shuma Ukin burned to death during the destruction of Babylon, though it is unclear if he committed suicide, was murdered, or was killed in an accident. According to Ashurbanipal's prisms, Shamash Shuma Ukin was thrown into the flames by the god Asher himself. Several non-cuneiform versions of the story survive. An Aramaic version of the report can be found on an Egyptian papyrus fragment from the 4th century BC. Even the Greek tale of Sardanapalus may have been inspired by it. Shamash Shuma Ukin is missing from the Assyrian relief that shows Ashurbanipal taking Babylon's surrender and tribute regardless of what happened to him. After defeating the Assyrians in Babylon, Nabopolassa took the throne as the new king of Babylon. After the war, Babylon was ruled by Kandalanu, but there is very little information about him in the textual record. In the next two decades, Babylonia recovered economically but fell into political chaos after Ashurbanipal and Kandalanu died in 627 BC. While Assyria held northern Mesopotamia with the help of its former rival, Egypt, the Assyrian and Egyptian forces were defeated decisively at the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. Assyria never regained the upper hand. Nineveh fell to the Babylonians and Medes in 612 BC. As a result of the fall of the Assyrian Empire, Babylon became a crucial player in the Middle East. The Neo-Babylonian period Babylon Triumphant The new dynasty of Nabopolassar, 625-605 BC, and Nebuchadnezzar II, 605-562 BC, established Babylon as the capital of an empire extending from the Zagros Mountains to the Mediterranean Sea. Assyria had some links with this dynasty, today is known as Neo-Babylonian. In the Old Testament, the dynasty is referred to as Chaldean, and modern scholarship has determined that Nabopolassar was a member of the Bit Yakin tribe, although there is limited evidence to support this. Nabopolassar inherited territory and administration from the Assyrian Empire, regardless of the dynasty's origins. A rivalry between the Assyrians and Egyptians for control of the domain of the Levant was also passed to the Babylonian kings. 
Nebuchadnezzar had already successfully campaigned against Egypt in the West as crown prince. The Babylonian king had to ensure that the subject states did not shift their allegiances or withdraw their tribute from the Babylonian crown. This was a problem for Judah. It took Nebuchadnezzar two times to re-establish his authority in Jerusalem, in 597 and 587 to 586 BC. During the first exile in Babylon, Judean king Jehoiachin, his family and other deportees were taken. Jerusalem was sacked on the second day, the temple was looted, and more Jews were deported to Babylon. There may have been further deportations in 582 to 581 BC, based on the book of Jeremiah. This event will be discussed in more detail in the next chapter. For now, suffice to say that this aspect of Nebuchadnezzar's reign has defined the king and his city far more entirely than could have been predicted at the time. Deportations of this kind had a long tradition, and no aspects of the procedure were inherently new or unusual. Early in the first millennium BC, Assyria controlled a large territory. Due to this expansion, the administration developed slowly and piecemeal. Assyrian heartland wealth was primarily derived from taxes and tributes from provinces, vassals and puppet states. However, it was complicated to govern such a vast and disparate empire. Keeping uprisings at bay on the edges of the empire was a significant concern for Assyrian kings. Deportations in mass are among them. Often when the new territory was conquered, or a rebellious vassal was crushed, the imperial presence in the trouble spot was complemented by the removal of large numbers of indigenous people to the imperial centre, effectively breaking up rebellious populations and reducing the potential for future resistance to the imperial rule. From the Neo-Assyrian period to the Persian conquest of Babylon in 539 BC, the practice was effective. Some immigrants at the centre of the empire, like Daniel in the Bible, rose to high status positions, but most were not servants. Eventually he becomes a trusted royal confidant and receives a complete Babylonian scribal education. Deportations, also common in later empires, even if less formalised, can also be seen as a harmonising and inclusive way to create and maintain a viable imperial identity. To rule a kingdom with religious and ethnic diversity effectively, Non-Babylonians are understandably pessimistic about the policy. Among these foreign sources, the biblical references covering the Judean exile have had a far more significant impact in forming a modern identity for ancient Babylonia than any other ancient texts, including those of the imperial elites themselves. From the perspective of biblical authors, the destruction and deportation of Jerusalem and the subsequent deportation of Jews to Babylon, is a significant event and a symbol of enormous significance for Judaism and Christianity. Judea's exile would undoubtedly have come as a surprise to Nebuchadnezzar. The most influential acts of his reign were establishing an empire under his father, Nabopolassar, and rebuilding Babylon as an imperial capital. As revealed by archaeologists in the early 20th century, the city was predominantly built by Nebuchadnezzar in the early 6th century BC, precisely the period most relevant to the Judean exile and to Babylon's most significant global significance. The inscriptions on his buildings and a text called Nebuchadnezzar, King of Justice, detail Nebuchadnezzar's achievements. His service to the wicked's law, order and punishment makes him a model of a just king, there is more evidence in Nebuchadnezzar's inscriptions that he referred to antiquity and Hammurabi's qualities resemble those of the king's most illustrious predecessor. Nebuchadnezzar's monumental inscriptions are written in an archaizing script typical of the old Babylonian period, thus reflecting the pronouncements of a king who had reigned over a millennium earlier. Upon the death of Nebuchadnezzar, Amel Marduk was heir to his throne. In Babylon, court life could be precarious, evidenced by the speed with which successions followed. The latter was once out of favour and imprisoned, a victim of court intrigue. Amel Marduk lasted only two years in his own right, asking after his father Nebuchadnezzar 
ruled for over four decades. Although he may have acted as regent in the final years of his father's reign, Amal Marduk ruled for over four decades. The latter took the throne after killing his brother-in-law, Neriglissar, in 560 BC. However, Neriglissar died soon after he took the throne. After only three months on the throne, his son, Labashi Marduk, died, almost certainly murdered. Nabonidus, 556-539 BC, was the next monarch to hold the throne, a king who would be more long-lived but not necessarily more prosperous. Was Labashi Marduk murdered by Nabonidus? In his stella, Nabonidus explains that Labashi Marduk sat on the royal throne against the gods' intentions when he was a minor, adding that he is the executor of Nebuchadnezzar and Neriglissar's wills. The Kings and Queens Before Me In his defence, Doherty points out that there is no mention of the killing of Labashi Marduk, nor of usurpation of the throne, and that since Nabonidus is keen to stress his links with Nebuchadnezzar and Neriglissar, rather than to begin a new dynasty, there is sufficient support for the theory that the last reign of the Neo-Babylonian Empire was a continuation of the Neo-Bar. Nonetheless, there are obvious political reasons for not mentioning murder or usurpation, and referring to earlier kings in support of a claim to the throne. In addition, the story's details were preserved by later Babylonian historian Berossus, who maintained Nabonidus' indictment of Labashi Marduk, claiming that the young king had been murdered as a result of a coup. We must consider Labashi Marduk to have been murdered and Nabonidus to have been the beneficiary of a violent coup, if not the leader. The conspirators elevated Nabonidus to the throne. Nabonidus did not belong to the royal family. According to him, despite being the son of a nobody, he had no expectations of kingship, but his background was not humble. He claims to have faithfully served kings from Nebuchadnezzar in his inscriptions, and he may even be the Labinitus of Babylon, who appears in Herodotus as a broker of peace between Lydia and Media. Despite this, Nabonidus' own account suggests his accession was sufficiently unexpected as to require a greater degree of divine sanction. This is the great miracle of sin that none of the other gods know how to accomplish, and that has not happened to this country since ancient times. I am Nabonidus, king of Babylon, and you are Sin, the lord of all gods and goddesses in heaven. When the gods and goddesses prayed to Sin for Nabonidus, the lonely one who has no one, whose heart lacked thought of kingship, Sin called me to kingship. A significant figure in the Babylonian pantheon was the moon god. However, most kings devoted themselves to the Babylonian patron deity Marduk and his son, Nabu. According to the inscriptions of Adagupi, the high priestess of the moon god Sin at Haran, Nabonidus was also appointed king by the moon god, and his own notes imply that during his reign, Nabonidus concentrated unusually on the cult of sin. From the surviving textual sources, Nabonidus' devotion to the moon god arose from his upbringing, particularly from his remarkable mother. Despite being more than two millennia away, Adagupi strikes an imposing figure. Almost no Mesopotamian royal woman's name has survived. The fact that long texts have survived describing her life is virtually unique. In addition to suggesting power, ancient texts testify to an incredibly long and healthy life, especially in the ancient world. Two stelae from Haran contain Adagupi's autobiography. According to the autobiography, Adagupi lived to 104. Throughout her lifetime, she tells us, I had good eyesight, excellent hearing, good hands and feet, well-chosen words, good food and drink, good health and a happy mind. My great-grandchildren were healthy up to the fourth generation, and I thus had my fill of old age. Because several of the most important surviving sources are unambiguously anti-Nabonidus propaganda, it is difficult to judge how far Nabonidus actually diverged from his court's expectations. The gathering of God's statues 
from other cities in Babylon before the Persian invasion is a prime example. It was conceived as a matter of their own choice that the gods entered the town, and not all local deities entered the city on this occasion. After the conquest, it was easy to accuse them of bringing the statues into the city against their will, hence their subsequent failure to protect the town or its king. Nabonidus' long absence from Babylon is the most puzzling aspect of his reign. Nabonidus travelled to Tamar in northwestern Arabia around 553 BC, where he stayed for the next ten years, leaving his son, Belshazzar, the biblical Belshazzar, to rule Babylon. Even though this arrangement was highly irregular, it was also far from satisfactory since the king could not perform cultic duties, which were subsequently neglected for a decade. The reasons behind Nabonidus' decision to stay away from it are unclear. From his own account, priests and citizens of Babylon, Borsippa and Nippur, rebelled against the king. All three Uruks and Lhasas refused to contribute to rebuilding Haran's Ekulkul, Temple of Sin. However, Nabonidus' departure was connected to Babylon's suffering from disease and famine at the same time. A tradition preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, known as the Prayer of Nabonidus, claims that it was the king himself who suffered the disease. I, Nabonidus, was smitten with the evil Busha disease for seven years, until I became a dying man. I prayed to the highest, and he forgave me. Then a holy Judean came to me from the exiles and said, Proclaim your forgiveness, and write it down to give honour and glory to the highest. Political and economic reasons are also possible. The value of trade in aromatics and spices was enormous, and rising in the 6th century BC, leading Nabonidus to conquer and control the Arabian trade routes. However, the Babylonian presence is only accounted for in this way in general. However, it does not explain why Babylon's king would want or need to be present, neglecting his political and religious duties. In the verse account of Nabonidus, an anti-Nabonidus text, it is stated that the Babylonian New Year festival is known as Akitu, the most important in the calendar, and could not be performed during Nabonidus' absence. Belshazzar played a role that Belshazzar could not act as regent in his role as king. The verse account is a propaganda text, but Nabonidus' own royal chronicles confirm that the Akitu festival had a hiatus. In the month of Nisanu, the king did not attend the New Year ceremony. The god Nabu did not visit Babylon. Bel's image did not leave Esagila in procession, and the New Year festival was omitted. Babylon welcomed Nabonidus back in 543 BC. However, by then, power balances in the Middle East were shifting. Cyrus II of Persia in southern Iran had overthrown its king, Astyages, by leading a successful rebellion against the western Iranian empire of Media in 559 BC. From here, the conquest of Turkey, including the Lydian empire of King Croesus, eventually led Cyrus to a position from which he could challenge the Babylonian throne. During the Battle of Opis in 539 BC, Cyrus' armies defeated Nabonidus and Belshazzar, allowing him to enter Babylon peacefully. The Cyrus Cylinder, the Persian king's own account of his conquest, details this. There's a good chance Cyrus' familiar elements inside the city also contributed to the lack of resistance. There has been a popular theory that priests of Marduk at Esagila, disaffected by Nabonidus' preference for the moon goddess Sin, were responsible for Cyrus' entry into Babylon and the composition of propaganda documents such as the Cyrus Cylinder. We do not know what will happen to Nabonidus and Belshazzar. According to the 3rd century BC historian Berossus, Nabonidus was captured by Cyrus but not executed. Instead, he was given land in Carmania, Kerman, in southeastern Iran, a remote outpost of Cyrus' vast new empire. The Persian Empire and Babylon
Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled in 539 BC with Cyrus' conquest of Babylon. The language of that prophecy suggested total destruction. But the win happened in an otherwise quiet transition between the Neo-Babylonian dynasty and the Persians. As part of the vast Archaemenid Empire, Babylon survived. The empire built by Cyrus and his successors was far more extensive than any previous political unit, stretching from the eastern Mediterranean in the west to Central Asia in the east. There was no sign that Babylon was becoming a small fish in a big pond. The city remained a royal capital, though only one of four, a major administrative centre and possibly the world's biggest market. Cyrus himself was interested in supporting an image of continuity, as can be seen from the text of the famous Cyrus Cylinder. Hormuzd Razam excavated the cylinder in Babylon in the late 19th century. It describes Cyrus restoring order to Babylonian religious and cultural life after Nabonidus' strange reign. Documents in Babylonian format and language were dedicated to the god Marduk, the city's chief deity. Although it is a record of the city's conquest, a significant event in history in itself, its modern renown arises from a particular aspect of this conquest, the end of the Judean exile, and its intimate connection with the Bible. During the two centuries of Persian rule, 539 to 330 BC, Babylon continued to play a crucial role in politics, culture and economy, now as part of a much larger empire. As the Second Temple period began in Jerusalem, it is easy to forget that the whole region was still under the rule of a foreign empire, administered in part by Babylon. After Cambyses' successful campaign of 525 to 522 BC, that empire also incorporated Egypt, removing the last significant power in the region and ensuring that the small kingdoms of the Levant would only exist under Persia. Although many view the Cyrus Cylinder as an ancient charter of human rights because it supports the biblical story of the return to Jerusalem, it's not this. It's a document representing benevolent kingship. People's rights are modern in nature and were alien to the world in which the text was written. Persia's rule was not always accepted. Persian kings faced more Babylonian rebellions, one of which may have forced Xerxes to close Esagila, the great temple of Marduk, and perhaps even destroy the god's cult status. Alexander The Macedonian army defeated the Persian army decisively at the Battle of Gorgamela, 331 BC, which led to the retreat of Darius III. Alexander, who had defeated the incumbent king in battle elsewhere, entered the world's most heavily fortified city through open doors, as Cyrus did. Having outlived his usefulness, his erstwhile allies killed him for his efforts to organise further resistance to Alexander. Alexander's defeat of Darius at Gorgamela and entry into Babylon are precisely recorded in the Babylonian Astronomical Diary, but no additional information is provided. Greek sources are the principal sources for this story. According to some historians, Alexander's rule continued the Archimanid government, with the real break occurring after his death in 323 BC. Babylon certainly fits this description, in keeping with his predecessor's grand tradition. Alexander had begun to restore the city's temples, including the ziggurat Etenmenaki and Esagila. Alexander's Macedonian generals were reportedly increasingly dismayed by his willingness to adopt Persian court customs and manners, such as accepting divine honours. Proskinesis, prostrating oneself, kneeling or bowing as an act of homage, was particularly unacceptable to Macedonians, who felt proud of their egalitarian traditions. The funeral pyre of Alexander's companion, Hephaestion, who had died at Ekbatana in 324 BC, modern Hamadan in western Iran, was one of Alexander's most significant projects in Babylon. Diodorus describes the destruction of an immense stretch of the city wall to create a pyre, 
which measured around 200 metres on each edge and was then lavishly decorated. According to Diodorus, more than 240 golden quinquiremes were arranged in close order upon the foundation course. Each cathede carried two kneeling archers four cubits high and on the deck armed male figures five cubits high with red banners made out of felting occupying the intervening spaces. The torches, which stood 15 cubits tall on the second level, were adorned with golden wreaths around their handles. Their wings spread on their flaming ends perched eagles, looking downward, while they slithered serpents, watching the eagles around their bases. Wild animals were carved on the third level, being pursued by hunters. A centauromachy was depicted in gold on the fourth level, and lions and bulls alternated on the fifth level. Macedonian and Persian arms covered the next higher level, demonstrating the prowess of one's person and the defeat of the other. Above all stood sirens, hollowed out and able to conceal lamenters, singing a lament in mourning for the dead. Despite dark portents and warnings from Chaldean sages, the classical accounts of his death in Babylon remain disputed. The precise details need not have been credited. Still, again according to Diodorus, whose source is the Alexander historian Clytarchus, Alexander showed such zeal about the funeral that it surpassed all those celebrated on earth and left no possibility of a more excellent funeral in the future. Alexander, a self-styled Achilles, who lost his Patroclus in Hephaestion, would undoubtedly behave in this manner. Sadly, in June 323 BC, Alexander himself died from a fever after two weeks. There have been malaria, typhoid and poisoning suggestions, though the latter seems unlikely. At Babylon, few of Alexander's own building projects were completed. Despite Alexander's efforts, the ziggurat was not restored, Strabo records that just clearing the rubble of the ziggurat required 2,000 men for two months and that the work was not continued by Alexander's successors. Under Alexander, what appeared to be a nascent process of orientalizing a Hellenistic empire turned out to be the opening of conduits for Hellenistic art and culture to spread into large parts of Western and Central Asia. A process had begun under the Archaemenid kings and with it, the flow of art and ideas between East and West intensified. From this point on, Hellenistic culture can be felt strongly in Mesopotamia and even further East. Babylon is no longer visible. Babylon's destruction came gradually and through economic and political shifts rather than military force, despite the power and longevity of the image of a cataclysmic event. A new capital was founded at Seleucia, on the Tigris, in the 4th century BC, after Seleucus Nicator gained the Western Asian provinces from Alexander's former generals in the battle for succession. This greatly expanded pre-existing settlement on the Tigris. Babylon's decline was unavoidable after the new city became a major centre for trade, though it continued to serve as a centre of cultic and scholarly activity. The cuneiform script was used in Babylon's temples by the 1st century AD, so the old documents could still be read. There is no clear picture of Babylon's decline in economic importance over the centuries, nor its depopulation. After the Parthian sack of 127 BC, the city never recovered, and is probably more of a ruin than anything resembling its former glory. However, the journey from the world's capital to complete abandonment was extremely long, probably more than 1,500 years long. In the 10th century AD, Ibn Khwaqal mentions a small village called Babel. Even this seems to have disappeared by Rabbi Benjamin of Tudela's visit in the 12th century. Several villages still surround the site, but the main local settlement grew from the 12th century onwards to become the present town of Al-Hilah. The fading from view, in a sense, is more complete than violent destruction. As with its beginning, the last days of Babylon were as unspectacular 
and went unnoticed by posterity. Ghosts of Babylon Summary The above is intended merely to provide some historical context for what follows. Outline Babylon's place in the history of the ancient Middle East and give an approximate historical and archaeological view from which to proceed in looking at other renditions of the old city. However, before moving on to later traditions, it might be worth considering the body of myth, legend and lore developed around Babylon within the ancient Mesopotamian culture. Rather than the old city itself, this book explores its reception and representation, its afterlife. At the dawn of time, Babylon was not only the centre of the universe, but also the place of creation. Mesopotamian views of the 2nd and 1st millennia BC are only slightly overstated. As described in Enuma Elish, the epic poem, depicting the world's design in a form that was probably adapted to fit the political realities of Babylon's resurgence under Nebuchadnezzar I. Marduk is the hero god, who can bring order out of chaos. Marduk can create the world and its centre, Babylon, by defeating the monstrous army of Tiamat, the primordial sea. Marduk's rise in the pantheon, replacing previous supreme gods such as Enlil, coincided with Nebuchadnezzar I's recovery of the god statue from Susa, after being taken as war booty after the Kassite dynasty collapsed. The event became a legend, and Nebuchadnezzar himself became an icon of Babylonian culture. Babylon played a role in other mythologies as a city of sufficient importance. The rise and fall of the kings of Akkad at the end of the 3rd millennium BC is one of the most mythologized areas of Mesopotamian history. Sargon of Akkad ruled over all of Mesopotamia. He claimed to have campaigned from the Upper Sea, the Mediterranean, to the Lower Sea, the Persian Gulf. It is little wonder, then, that as the founder of Mesopotamia's even the world's first empire. As Sargon's fame grew, he eventually acquired the status of a legendary hero king, with qualities comparable to those of Gilgamesh, the legendary king of Uruk. As great as Sargon's fame was, his biggest obstacle was the weather. His grandson Naram-Sin, however, would be remembered in infamy. Throughout his reign, Naram-Sin appears to have been a highly successful king, a military leader in the tradition of his illustrious predecessor. He also happens to appear with the horned cap of a deity on a victory stella, the first ancient Mesopotamian king to be deified. His name became associated with the decline of Akkadian power only after his reign. Nevertheless, he became the king who caused and presided over the city's destruction in legend. The texts describe Akkad's abandonment by the gods due to Naram-Sin's impious rebuilding of the temple of Enlil at Nippur, which he carried out, despite not receiving the necessary favourable omens. A further legend of impiety concerns Sargon and the very foundation of Akkad. According to the Vedna Chronicle, Sargon chose to name Babylon, the city for which he took soil from Babylon against the will of Marduk, is another transgression. As Naram-Sin committed further offences, the text says he destroyed the people of Babylon. Marduk's wrath came from Gutian invaders from Iran, causing chaos and collapse, ultimately giving the king of Ur sovereignty over the whole world. Building Akkad appears to have been a hubristic attempt to find a new Babylon or create a mirror image of Babylon. And so Akkad's history is another chapter in the story of divine favour and destiny that is actually Babylonian. This is very different from our understanding of events at the time. Babylon's rise to prominence among southern Iraq cities did not occur until centuries after the fall of Akkad. The only evidence that Babylon existed during Sargon's time is the minimal evidence mentioned at the beginning of this chapter. Nevertheless, the perception that Babylon was a city of extreme antiquity seems widespread, with the epic of creation being only one example of interest in the city's origins and ancient past. With an eye to the future, 
Mesopotamian kings recorded their achievements in various ways, including burying foundation inscriptions while building new structures and restoring temples, city walls and palaces. Throughout Mesopotamian history, it was common to conceal foundation documents and the discovery of such documents by subsequent kings during their own restoration work was considered auspicious. Nebuchadnezzar II's use of an archaic script in his building inscriptions shows an acute awareness of the city's antiquity in the later periods of Babylon. For Hammurabi's script to be rendered accurately on Nebuchadnezzar's monuments, the comprehensive epigraphic scholarship was required to bridge millennia of change, and the evidence does exist of scribal study of earlier scripts. Tales from Babylon and Borsippa clearly show that Neo-Babylonian scribes collected and studied ancient documents bearing earlier writings to reconstruct lost sound values to a certain extent. Aside from its technical aspect, the practice reveals a sense of reverence for Hammurabi himself, knowledge of Babylon's incredible history, and the accomplishments of earlier rulers. Interestingly, his name was derived from another predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, who had recovered the statue of Marduk for Babylon some 500 years earlier, and whose mighty reign had also become part of the city's mythology. Exilic stories can be found in Two Kings, Two Chronicles, and as prophecy, Jeremiah. This, like the Exodus, whose Old Testament form seems heavily influenced by the Babylonian captivity, is the story of forced migration on which later Jewish and Christian traditions focused as a touchstone of all righteous struggles against oppression. The siege of Jerusalem and captivity are the subjects of the final chapters in both Two Kings and Two Chronicles, though they end at different points. On the 27th day of the 12th month of King Jehoiachin's of Judah's exile year, in the year of King Evil Merodach Amal Marduk's accession, King Jehoiachin was released by King Evil Merodach Amal Marduk of Babylon. The king freed him from prison, treated him well, and gave him a place at the table above the kings with him in Babylon. For the remainder of his life, Jehoiachin lived as a pensioner of the king, discarding his prison clothes. Although it covers only a very brief period of the captivity, Two Chronicles extends to Cyrus' rule and the Judeans' release. A particularly striking link between the Bible and archaeology is found in its final two passages, repeated at the beginning of Ezra, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, originally a single book. Since the text closely parallels that of Cyrus' cylinder, one of the most important primary sources on the transition between the Babylonian and the Archaemenid empires. The propaganda that Cyrus of Persia used to conquer Babylon in 539 BC followed the format and language of Nebuchadnezzar II. The Cyrus Cylinder is remarkable in that it is a traditional Babylonian document in some respects. Cylinders are rooted in tradition to the extent that they use language and script and even pay homage to the Babylonian god Marduk. In fact, it refers to the discovery during Persian building works of an inscription from Ashurbanipal, an ancient king. Of course, Cyrus also succeeded in demonizing his predecessor, Nabonidus, at the same time as he linked himself with the long tradition of Babylonian kingship. The legend of Nabonidus, ignorant, irresponsible and possibly insane, has gone on to have an exciting life of its own in culture, as we will see in the chapters to come. Biblical tradition preserved Cyrus and Nabonidus' descriptions of their behaviour. A later perspective indicates that Cyrus's account of his conquest also seemed to have followed a consistent pattern of Babylonian conquerors, emphasising the city's peaceful entry, reverence for its gods and civic responsibility. In particular, accounts of Alexander's behaviour mirror the dynasty's founder. They are all mythologised representations of Babylon legends that persisted even within the living city itself. In Babylon, myths, fantasies and legends were so powerful that they ultimately obscured the ancient town. 
We now turn to the city's biblical and ancient Greek accounts to understand the town's transformation. This begins a long tradition. The Bible and classical sources relating to tyrants and wonders. Cuneiform was nearly extinct by the 1st century AD. Babylon appears to have been one of the last centres of manuscript preservation. Preserved in venerable temple institutions such as Esagila, but such isolated pockets of cuneiform scholarship were destined to disappear. Currently, the earliest cuneiform texts date from the 1st century AD. Babylon's survival depends significantly on the demise of cuneiform, particularly the ability to read cuneiform documents. The history, literature, mythology and scholarship of ancient Mesopotamia were lost for 2,000 years and not until the mid-19th century would they once again be accessible. Therefore, it is paramount to our story that we understand the content and character of non-cuneiform ancient Babylonian sources. After the extinction of cuneiform, two groups of sources became available, biblical texts and classical Greek accounts. While both groups share language, subject matter and focus, characteristics that set them apart in broad terms, they also differ in many other respects. They include mythology and folklore, ethnographic observations, geographical descriptions, and historical accounts with moral commentary, among other things. All European tradition in ancient Babylon is ultimately derived from biblical and classical sources. The Biblical and Classical Sources a distance from ancient Mesopotamian sources repeatedly raises factual accuracy and perspective questions. Although it is essential to address the problem of accuracy and the limitations of ancient sources' knowledge of Babylonia, while limited in terms of truthfulness, these perspectives also illuminate much about Babylon's role in the wider world. Glimpses become enigmas, with an enigma such as the Hanging Gardens, Despite the difficulty separating the real from the legendary in these accounts, we have access to material as valuable as any native source, contemporary chroniclers of Babylon, as seen from without. Based on biblical sources, many of the references to Babylon in the Bible refer to the town under the rule of Neo-Babylonian kings and their Persian successors in the 6th century BC. The Book of Rio Crypho is the only exception. They form a corpus composed over a millennium at different times in several languages, Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek, and in other political, social and cultural settings. The biblical narratives concerning Babylon actually focus on a brief period in the city's history, which is all the more remarkable. There is voluminous scholarship on many of these passages, far beyond the scope of this book. We simply give a brief overview of Babylon's most influential themes in the following. Genesis Initially, this claim of historical focus may seem a bit far-fetched. However, it can be explained by the timeless mythic character of the most famous biblical stories involving Babylon, the Tower of Babel. With one language and an everyday speech, the world was united. They settled on a plain in Shinar as they moved eastward. We shall make bricks and bake them thoroughly together, they said. Brick replaced stone, and tar replaced mortar. So they built themselves a tower that reached to the heavens, so that they could make a name for themselves and not scatter over the entire earth. Let's confuse their language so they don't understand each other. If they have begun to speak the same language as one people, nothing they plan to accomplish will be impossible. The Lord, however, came down to look at the city and the tower. As a result, the Lord scattered them from there throughout the earth, and they stopped building the city. The Lord confused all the languages there, so Babel was named so. God then dispersed them across the whole earth. The story involves a play on words. Babel is pronounced as a ball in Hebrew to confuse. The narrative tells the story of a city whose great size and pride led to hubris, decay, fragmentation, and confusion but it has also struck a chord with writers and artists throughout history. At first glance, the narrative appears to take place in a mythical past, 
that has no connection with the historical reality of 6th century BC Babylon. What is its origin? A Mesopotamian origin of some kind for the tower can be demonstrated relatively quickly, since it contains several references to materials characteristic of a Mesopotamian ziggurat, such as baked brick and bitumen. The specific mention of Etemananki in Babylon, of which more below, is an entirely different matter. But the idea of a Babylonian city dominating a ziggurat is evident. Not only the building described shows signs of Mesopotamian influence. In Mesopotamian literature, one of the biblical passages most clearly parallels the Tower of Babel narrative, genealogies that follow the flood, with lifespans that are considerably shorter than those that preceded. This parallels the early Sumerian king list in which a similar reduction towards a more mortal lifespan occurs. The Tower of Babel story only makes sense as a foreign Judean interpretation of the monuments, but one aspect resembles an ancient Mesopotamian explanation of death. Humans have been created to serve the gods, but in large numbers, they are noisy, says the myth is known as Atrahasis. Enlil, angered, sends a flood, but the population rises too quickly. To regulate numbers, Enlil must invent death. There are similar hints in the tower that human affairs may be governed by the comfort of the gods rather than a system of moral punishment and reward. And for these and other reasons, it has been suggested that the story is borrowed from Mesopotamia. The only possible reference is an omen that stated that if a city rose like a mountain peak to the interior of heaven, it would be turned to rubble. Although this correspondence is probably coincidental, it should be noted that the tower's physical destruction, instead of simply the cessation of construction due to the confusion of tongues, does not feature in Genesis at all. It appears instead in the Jewish antiquities of Josephus, whose moral interpretation of the story in the first century AD played a significant role in later performances. He also makes Nimrod the architect of the tower, following the implications of Genesis 10, and introduces a prophecy from the Sibyl paralleling Genesis. Perhaps more significant are the Babylonian traditions of Babylon as the first city, as in the creation epic Enuma Elish, and the descriptions of raising the top of Etemananki to vie with the heavens, Neo-Babylonian texts. However, a different passage provides the most unambiguous indication of the influence of Babylonian literature on Genesis, the account of the Flood, whose Babylonian equivalent was discovered by George Smith in 1872 to public astonishment. This story of Gilgamesh is a part of the Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh and is so closely related to Genesis that one could not deny that they are related. Genesis 11 does not mention Nimrod, but Genesis 10 originally a separate text, describes him as the son of Cush and Ham and as a mighty hunter before the Lord. Mesopotamian literature has been linked to him. Whatever the origin of his name, Genesis 10 describes him as the founder of Mesopotamian civilization. First, he founded cities in Babylonia, including Babylon and Akkad, then in Assyria, including Nineveh. Exile Many conflicting views exist regarding the date of the Yahwist source, and thus the Tower of Babel and much else in Genesis. According to tradition, the material dates to the 10th to 9th century BC, making it the oldest in the Bible. In recent years, some or even all of the Yahwist source has been argued to date much later, to the 6th century BC. There is no scholarly consensus on this vast and multifaceted question. Still, from the narrower perspective of Near Eastern political history and Mesopotamian influence, there may be reasons to consider the 6th century BC as a critical period during which many legends derived from or influenced by the Babylonian world entered the Judean religion ultimately. The Old Testament During the 6th century BC, Babylon and Judah experienced a period of highly close interaction events that in fact shape much of the Bible, known variously as the Jewish exile, the Babylonian captivity, 
and the Judean exile. In sum, Nebuchadnezzar II had to deal with rebellions and dissent in the provinces, even after securing the borders of his empire, against his main western rival, Egypt. Judah was one of the rebellious vassals during Nebuchadnezzar's besieging and recapture of Jerusalem in 597 and 587 BC. The city and its temple were sacked and looted. The town was flooded with water. Jerusalem's royal family, including the king and court, was exiled to Babylonia, where most of them stayed and became part of Babylonian society. Though the biblical perspective on these events is profoundly different from the Babylonian perspective, the basic facts of the case agree with those recorded in Babylonian sources. In many ways, exile is represented as a traumatizing separation from one's homeland, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we wept, is best known for expressing this profound spiritual loss. As we remembered Zion, we sat down and wept by the rivers of Babylon. The willow trees are where we hung our lyres. We sang them a song because those who had taken us captive asked us to do so. We were urged to rejoice by our captors. Sing us one of Zion's songs. How could we sing in a foreign land the Lord's song? If I forget you, Jerusalem, I wish my right hand to wither away. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. My chief joy will not be Jerusalem, if I don't set it above all else. Lord, recall the day when Jerusalem fell against the Edomites. Down with it, down with it. Down to its very foundations, they cried. Those who repay you for what you did to us will be happy. Babylon. Babylon the destroyer. Whoever grabs your babies and smashes them against a stone is happy. There is no mention of bitter feelings in the matter-of-fact Babylonian sources, or indeed, one may question the universality of such a strong feeling of bitterness among the Judeans themselves. Mogan's Troll Larson, an Assyrian archaeologist and historian of Mesopotamian archaeology, argue a provocative argument for the biblical perspective. Those sent from the provincial outpost of Jerusalem to Babylon were somewhat like those sent from Ponza into exile in Paris. It is surprising that many of them returned after 60 years. Although a few did, those who returned were full of the rage of injured pride, a feeling they conveyed in their dreams and prophecies. These narratives have their place in history, one pushing for the retention of a distinct identity during the exile the other toward assimilation into Babylonian culture. Exile is structured around opposition to Babylon, but much of the Old Testament content is influenced by Babylonian culture. To fulfil the Lord's word spoken through Jeremiah, King Cyrus of Persia issued the following proclamation throughout his kingdom, which the king also wrote down. Cyrus of Persia decreed, The Lord God of heaven has blessed me with all the kingdoms on earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. May the Lord his God be with everyone among you who belongs to his people, and may he go up. In Ezra the proclamation is complete. May the God of the people of whoever belongs to their people be with them, and let them build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, in Jerusalem. In addition to the voluntary offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem, that every Jew left among us, wherever he may be settled, be assisted by his neighbours with silver and gold, goods and livestock. In one Estras, the Apocrypha includes a variant of the exact text. A central theme of the Old Testament is the Second Temple. It is widely agreed that the biblical passage refers to the same proclamation as the Cyrus Cylinder, one of many written versions of a declaration made by Cyrus. The cylinder includes provisions for gods and people to return to their homes. It is reflected in the Babylonian context of the cylinder that the examples given are Mesopotamian and Elamite and do not include Jerusalem. However, it is clear enough that Ezra does not provide the exact words of Cyrus, who was not a convert to Judaism himself. However, due to his role as liberator, He has been portrayed sympathetically in biblical accounts and, by extension, in later histories. 
Jeremiah and Isaiah's condemnations of Babylon and its kings are fiercest. The king of Babylon is explicitly linked to Lucifer in one passage of Isaiah. Lucifer is the Latin Vulgate translation of Helel ben Shaha, meaning son of dawn, son of the morning, day star, or shining one in English. A song mocking the fallen king of Babylon makes the following reference. The morning star, son of the dawn, how have you fallen from heaven? You who once laid low nations have been cast to the ground. From the bottom of your heart you said, The heavens will rise for me. Above the stars of God I will raise my throne. On the utmost heights of the sacred mount, I will enthrone myself with the support of the assembly. I will be like the highest. I will ascend above the clouds. However, you are brought down to the depths of hell, to the realm of the dead. You are pondered by those who see you. Did this man shake the earth and make kingdoms tremble? the man who turned the world into a wilderness and overthrew its cities, did he not want his captives to return home? Daniel From the biblical sources alone, it is not always obvious how many of the Neo-Babylonian kings survived into the Old Testament. Other biblical accounts do not specify who the last king of Babylon was, and the Isaiah account does not identify the morning star. Daniel highlights the problem of royal names and chronology even more, but in many ways, this is the definitive biblical version of Babylon, a detailed illustration of the Babylonian court that has inspired and informed most other representations of Babylon since. Neo-Babylonian and Archaemenid worlds are represented, though the Aramaic text dates several centuries after Nebuchadnezzar's time, this prediction of future events written as prophecy in the text gives us an easy way to determine the earliest date of composition, as with much apocalyptic literature. Using this approach was conducted during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, 175-164 BC. During the Babylonian rule cycle, Nebuchadnezzar II was followed by Belshazzar and Darius the Mede, whose identification has proven difficult. There is also a break between the narrative and visions that coincides with a markedly more negative attitude towards the Babylonians. The narrative follows Daniel's career as a prophet and dream interpreter at the court of successive Babylonian kings. Daniel in the Bible is likely to be a composite figure, since such a career for a Judean in Babylon is plausible. It is Collins' contention that the tradition of this prophet dates back to before the Babylonian captivity. Daniel may have more in common with Enoch than with Ezra or Baruch. Outside of the actual book of Daniel, there is no mention of a prophet with this name in the Bible. However, we find two references to Daniel in Ezekiel, a true prophet of the exile. Ezek 14.14 When a land sins against God, even if Noah, Daniel and Job were there, they could not save their lives. In Ezekiel 28.3, the king of Tyre is taunted. Are you wiser than Daniel? 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 These references suggest Daniel was the name of a legendary wise and righteous man. It seems less likely that Collins' explanation that Ezekiel refers to a prophet of his own day, likening Daniel to those from legend. Despite the more distant origins of the Daniel tradition, the biblical text clearly refers to the Persian and Neo-Babylonian courts of the 6th century BC. Daniel interprets a series of dreams and omens in the early part of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is the main king Daniel serves, but Belshazzar and Darius the Mede are also figuring in the narrative. Due to the later date of the source, it does not contain information on the other Neo-Babylonian kings, including Nabonidus, the last of the dynasty. During his father's absence in Arabia, Belshazzar, the son of Nabonidus, acted as regent at Babylon. The length of the absence, and the fact that he is remembered as a king in the book of Daniel, indicate that his role as regent was more than token. Daniel transforms the regency into a reign as king, and Nabonidus is forgotten, although he had returned from Arabia before the Persian conquest. Nabonidus' complete obscurity reflects Cyrus's final success. 
who had taken pains to make sure that Nabonidus' name and memory were systematically erased. Daniel's fiery furnace story plays a vital role in later tradition. As punishment for refusing to worship the golden idol erected by Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire. All three are unharmed once inside the furnace. In Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, the fourth man appears like a god as he walks through the fire. The story is an excellent example of the ambiguity of Nebuchadnezzar's role in Daniel. If he does not convert the Jews, he issues the following remarkable decree. Anyone who speaks blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is to be hacked limb from limb, and his house is to be reduced to rubble, for there is no god who can save in such a manner. In addition to oppressing the Jews, he acts as a sponsor to Daniel and other Jews, and is willing to accept Daniel's advice and interpretations of dreams. Daniel is perhaps best known for the story of Nebuchadnezzar's seven years in the wilderness. A cuneiform text related to Nabonidus is believed to have inspired this story. Nabonidus supposed sinful behavior before the fall of Babylon was detailed in the Cyrus Cylinder and verse account of Nabonidus in particular. In addition to neglecting the capital and its cults, Nabonidus' attempt to elevate the role of the moon god, Sin, at Agupi's temple to the same god at Haran, at the expense of the Babylonian Marduk, priesthood, provided ample scope for Persian anti-Nabonidus propaganda. In this Dead Sea Scroll text known as the Prayer of Nabonidus, Nabonidus lived apart from men for seven years, while suffering from what may have been a disfiguring disease. This added to what was already more of a legend than a biography. In Daniel, the disease is transformed again. It becomes seven years of madness, not as punishment for Nabonidus' heresy, but as punishment for Nebuchadnezzar's pride, while the city's downfall is associated with Belshazzar. Unlike the Babylon of Nabonidus, which was ruled by the Persian Cyrus, the Babylon of Belshazzar was governed by the aged Darius the Mede. Nebuchadnezzar is not the only historical figure whose stories are attributed to Nabonidus. Hebrew, Aramaic, and later Arabic writers associated Nebuchadnezzar with other figures, including two much more recent invaders of Jerusalem, the Roman emperors Vespasian and Titus. Observing the Roman emperor's attribution of Nebuchadnezzar's identity, al-Biruni, 973-1048 AD, said, It seems the people of Jerusalem call everyone who destroys their town Nebuchadnezzar. The book of Daniel does show confusion regarding the identity of his successors, but it may be a deliberate conflation of Nabonidus and Nebuchadnezzar in this case. The conflation must have been intentional if the authors had drawn directly from Babylonian sources. Unless the story at some point replaced the name Nabonidus with King of Babylon, at least one person in the chain must have heard or read Nabonidus, but written or said Nebuchadnezzar. The substitution of one historical name for another is clearly distinct from a gradual corruption of a single word, as in the case of our own Nebuchadnezzar, or the Hebrew variant Nebuchadrezzar, from the Babylonian Nabuchaduri Usur. Most likely any story about a king of Babylon would eventually be associated with the famous name Nebuchadnezzar. In addition to the absence of Nabonidus from the biblical account, there is confusion over the identity and location of his son, Belshazzar. In his study of Nabonidus and Belshazzar, Doherty summarizes 13 ancient non-cuneiform reports of the succession with significant differences in the order of rulers. But Belshazzar's most famous role is found in the book of Daniel, where as king of Babylon, he serves his nobles gold and silver taken from the temple in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. A mysterious warning, written on the wall, foreshadows God's punishment amid this moment of supreme blasphemy. It reads, You praise the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which could not see, hear, or understand. Your life and your ways were not honored by the God who holds them in his hands. Therefore he entrusted his hand with writing the inscription, 
This is what was written on the inscription. This is what these words mean. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parsin. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and put an end to it. We weighed you on the scales and found you wanting. The Medes and Persians have divided your kingdom, Perez said. Daniel is honoured by Belshazzar for relaying this warning, making him the empire's third highest officer, but to no avail. Soon after, Babylon is sacked by the Persians. Daniel's latter part contains apocalyptic visions. It is significant in later interpretations that the only Old Testament apocalyptic text is set in Babylon, but a description of the city's destruction is not included in the Daniel Apocalypse. Visions are too abstract to refer to a specific place, even though they describe particular events and geographical developments in the vaguer terms of prophecy. Daniel's vision of the time of the end begins with a war between the northern and southern kingdoms. Hellenistic monarchies ruled these nations. In Daniel 11, Alexander rises, and his empire is divided among the generals. There will be three more kings in Persia, I tell you, and then a fourth who will be richer than all the other kings. As soon as he gains power through his wealth, he will stir up all Greece against him. Then a mighty king will rise, a powerful ruler who will do whatever he pleases. Once he appears, his empire will be broken up and divided among the four winds of heaven. Since his kingdom will be uprooted and given to others, it won't go to his descendants, nor will it possess the power he exercised. Many accounts in the Old Testament describe the Babylonian captivity. Other than Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Jerusalem, Cyrus's return to Jerusalem, and the deportation to Babylon, many of the Old Testament books were written and or set in Babylonia. Besides this other association, the Mesopotamian literary traditions are often referred to in Old Testament narratives, such as Nahum and Song of Songs. Later readers, of course, were less conscious of this interweaving of literary traditions than they were of the history of the captivity, even if it was not strictly apocalyptic. Sinful Babylon's fate took on a far more dramatic character than that suggested by the Cyrus Cylinder in this history. Jeremiah provides the most vivid description. She has committed fornication with the kings of this earth, and the people of this world have drunk the wine of her fornication. Come, said one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls. I will give you the verdict of the great whore who enthrones over many glasses of water. He led me into the wilderness, and I saw a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns mounted on a woman. The woman was adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls in purple and scarlet. A gold cup held in her hand contained obscenities and the foulness of her fornication. A name was written on her forehead with a secret meaning. Babylon the Great, the mother of whores, and of every profanity known to man. I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people, and with the blood of those who had testified to Jesus. Revelation's apocalyptic imagery has undoubtedly informed many later representations of Babylon, as both the woman and the beast represent Babylon. Later on, Babylon was to be described and illustrated through imagery, language, and even the moral message of Revelation. There are no original symbols, nor is this a message that originated here. Take, for example, this passage from Jeremiah. God has held the golden cup of Babylon in his hand, all the earth to be drunk. She has made the nation mad by drinking her wine. The anthropomorphic Babylon of Revelation represents a significant change from the sinful Babylon of Isaiah. Her identity is infused into all the others once she is created. Revelation's violent, hallucinatory, apocalyptic visions become permanently intertwined with the conquest of Babylon and the Persian conquest of 539 BC. In the providential narrative of Christian history, Babylon transforms from an actual physical location in Mesopotamia into a spiritual one. Babylon here represented Rome and all of humanity's worldliness and wickedness, the place of crisis at which the great battle of the apocalypse would be fought, from whose destruction the new Jerusalem would rise again. Sources from the Classics
In ancient Greece, Herodotus and Titius of Nidus provide Babylon's most comprehensive and detailed accounts, the latter via Diodorus Siculus. In addition to the almost entirely lost description of Berossus, these accounts have influenced sources on Babylon from antiquity to the present. Herodotus' version is the oldest and best known of the three, and it is with his statement that we must begin to study the impact of classical sources on Babylon. Herodotus Herodotus' description of Babylon differs from the biblical accounts in that it describes precisely what it is. The study examines the city's layout, architecture, population, and customs, and has no biblical equivalent in this regard. Except for the old Tower of Babel, almost no description of the city's physical features appears in the Old Testament. Herodotus, however, gives a topographical survey with descriptions of its more remarkable buildings. Here, Greek audiences first encountered Babylon's walls, later cited as one of the world's seven wonders. Herodotus described the city as follows. The castle is surrounded by a wide, deep moat filled with water, and within it is a wall 50 royal cubits wide and 200 high. The royal cubit is a bit longer than the ordinary cubit. Lastly, I must describe the use of the soil dug out to make the moat and the method of building the wall. When the digging was completed, the shoveled earth was formed into bricks, which were then baked in ovens once a sufficient number was produced. Then, using hot bitumen for mortar, the workmen began reveting each side of the moat with bricks and then began constructing the actual wall. Every 30 brick courses, rush mats were laid between them. A row of one-roomed buildings was set up along each edge of the wall, facing inwards with enough space to accommodate a four-horse chariot. The division has a hundred gates, all of bronze, with uprights and lintels made of bronze. Herodotus and the veracity of his account have been subjected to much speculation based on this single passage. There are plenty of details to choose from from the impossible height and 100 gates to the accurate description of the baked bricks and the use of bitumen. Among them, Babylon's thickest inner city walls were enormous, validating Herodotus' claims, but whether chariots actually ran along with them, or even in a protected roadway between the two central banks, remains to be seen. Many of the inaccuracies and inconsistencies in ancient Babylonian descriptions cannot simply be explained by errors or ignorance. In the case of Herodotus, a new genre was established and certain historical circumstances. His authority claims were based on personal observation and research, and he was concerned for the listener's or reader's entertainment and pleasure. Narrative and entertainment were recognised in antiquity, but not always valued. Herodotus was not meant to complement Aristotle's description of him as a myth, Assyriologist A. H. Sace used Assyriology to interrogate ancient Greek sources in an early yet highly influential study of Herodotus' claims about Babylon. By working methodically through Herodotus' account, Sace's 1883 study effectively undermined the credibility of Herodotus' description and undermined the belief that he ever visited Babylon. Sace was not supportive of Herodotus as a historian, but he did have a clear idea of what Herodotus could offer a modern student, even if not an accurate historical description. The result of Oriental research about Herodotus is that the majority of what he claims to be able to tell us about the history of Egypt, Babylonia and Persia is in fact a collection of marchen, popular stories circulated among Greek loungers and half-caste dragomen on the fringes of the Persian Empire. These old tales add as much charm to Herodotus' pages as they do to the accounts of medieval travellers like Mandeville or Marco Polo. And it may be questioned whether they are not of more importance for the history of the human mind than the most accurate descriptions of kings and generals, war treaties and revolutions. For the student of folklore, they are invaluable as they are the only document we have that describes the legend of the Mediterranean in the 5th century before our era. Folklore and legends from the ancient past are indeed a 
precious resource. Herodotus' account is still worth reading, even if its entirety is proven false. Certainly it would still be included here since stories and ideas can be significant from a representational point of view, long after being discredited as historical sources, or even before having ever claimed that status in the first place. There may not be a better example of this than Babylon, but it is not an isolated case. The closest parallel is Venice, whose influence on the modern European imagination has little to do with historical details, except perhaps the life of Casanova. In 1992, Tanner published a study of the city's cultural identity entitled Venice Desired. Venice became an important central place in the European imagination as the wealthiest, most prosperous, and the most magnificent republic in history, now declining and fallen. Inextricably associated with desire, it is unlike any other city. From Byron to Sartre, the passion for Venice is a vital force and feature in European literature. Many European images of Babylon have something in common with this seductive Venice of the imagination. We can learn about ourselves through imagined cities, our modes of thinking, and how we organize and structure the world around us. However, even when we consider historiography and representation, the historical accuracy of ancient sources does matter. In Herodotus, we need to be able to distinguish between observation, hearsay, and imagination if we are to understand what it is that he wanted to communicate about Babylon and to differentiate what he describes from what we would be prepared to call history, however imperfect our understanding of the latter might be. While the main focus of this book is not assessing the veracity of Herodotus' assertions, it is disentangling the historiography that led to more recent representations. In this regard, it is worthwhile to note that much of Sace's original argument is currently being undermined by contemporary scholarship. A portion of the credibility lost by Herodotus' description of Babylon has been reclaimed. A surprising omission by Herodotus is that he did not mention the hanging gardens of Babylon. According to Sace, but in light of separate references to the parks in Berossus via Josephus, Titius via Diodorus Siculus, and Strabo, it is generally believed that Herodotus did not visit Babylon himself, or specifically did not visit the royal palace. Herodotus either did not see Babylon, there were no such gardens there to describe, or he had no knowledge of or access to royal gardens we might anticipate their use being highly regulated. This is not the first work to locate the gardens elsewhere. It has been suggested that Herodotus did not mention the gardens because they didn't exist, and that other authors describe the gardens as belonging to Sennacherib in Nineveh. E. A. Wallace Budge suggested Ekbatana as another possible site based on Hyginus's account of the palace and Pliny's attribution of the gardens to Cyrus. Moreover, he asserted that the descriptions of the hanging garden may have been transferred from the Cyrus garden, and in fact, its accounts are so contradictory that they cannot represent the same thing. There is still a debate about where the gardens should be located. Julian Reed has suggested that the western outwork between Babylon's southern palace and the Euphrates traditionally interpreted as a treasury of Ford because of its unusually thick walls, could also be the foundation for terraces. Its location would be consistent with ancient accounts. In addition, Reed asserts that Nineveh is not positively identified as the site in any textual source and that, in fact, whatever the intricacies of textual transmission, the classical writers who describe the Hanging Gardens or have been quoted as doing so are unanimous that what they are attempting to describe are the gardens at Babylon. Mark van der Meerup has done extensive research on the possibility that Babylon and Nineveh were conflated in the relevant Greek sources, arguing that Mesopotamian literature treated the fortunes and histories of the two cities as closely related and inversely proportional. 
that deliberate comparison could have contributed to their conflation. It is undisputed that such conflation exists to some extent. Accounts in which the Tigris runs through Babylon and the Euphrates through Nineveh are not uncommon. Nor is the tendency to refer to Mesopotamia as Assyria and to treat the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian periods as a single continuous empire in which they may have had a point. Later sources indicate that Nineveh was sometimes referred to as Bab, Bab, Bab. However, this argument has some problems. The engineering works of Sennacherib to water his own spectacular gardens at Nineveh do support them as candidates, and indeed, much more evidence survives for Nineveh than Babylon. But Herodotus may not have seen gardens for another reason. If there were hanging gardens at Babylon in the Persian period, Daly notes, they would have been gone by Herodotus' time, since the course of the Euphrates through the city changed, making such a garden impossible. Moreover, he would not have been able to see the gardens of Nineveh, whose palaces and imperial architecture had long since disappeared. There is still much debate about the extent and nature of the confusion between Babylon and Nineveh in the Greek sources in this case. However, besides drawing attention to this issue, Daly's analysis of the authorities about the Assyrian royal gardens at Nineveh has also revealed many problems with Sace's original argument against Herodotus having visited Babylon. According to Herodotus, there was a royal road from Sardis to Susa. Herodotus or a contemporary informant could have witnessed both this and the New Year Akitu festival because Xerxes did not wholly destroy the temple and statue of Marduk in Babylon. Late inscriptions contradict Sace's assertion that Nineveh was deserted entirely in the time of Herodotus, and therefore his informants for that city could not have been local, and that Herodotus' assertion that the Babylonian name for Aphrodite was Mylitta may be valid. The monuments Herodotus described covered much more than just physical structures. In part, his account could be classified as ethnographic, describing customs and beliefs that the writer himself observes as a detached observer. While the customs he describes are often outlandish and not literal, there are links suggesting origins either in reality or in Mesopotamian myth and folklore. It is far less clear why Herodotus recorded them. Given the ambiguity in his assessment, it is sometimes difficult to tell whether he approves of the traditions honestly or satirizes them. According to some critics, Herodotus' ethnographic writings are interpreted either positively or negatively. Herodotus notes points that distinguish this person from others, especially points that a Greek finds strange and therefore repellently interesting. The oddity is a principle of ethnocentricity. Laos bites woman is news. So Herodotus seems less a precursor of Malinowski and Boas, but of strange, as it seems, and believe it or not, he describes the most ingenious of Babylonian customs as the marriage market, a system in which the bride prices paid for the prettiest wives are used as dowries for the plainest, thus ensuring everyone can get married and redistributing wealth. Because a rich man would pay a high bride price while a poor Arietti sees Herodotus' approval here as sarcastic, noting that this admirable practice has fallen out of favour and another scheme has emerged in recent years, namely the prostitution of all girls of the lower classes, to alleviate the hardship and general ruin that followed upon the conquest. A contented community seems to result from the arrangement. Even so, there are several humorous elements in the description. The over-poetical phrase, grew ripe for marriage, the unquestionable ranking of the girl's beauty by the auctioneer, can there really be a debate about who is prettier? And Herodotus's quotation of the auctioneer's speech, who will take the least money for this one, 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 suggest perhaps that Herodotus is being sarcastic. Of course he is using a rhetorical device. If this is the best custom, 
How awful must all the other businesses be? Babylonian evidence does not substantiate observations and folklore from Babylonia, primarily marriage contracts and law codes. According to the author, Herodotus is sincere in his approval of the story, while tracing plausible Greek precedents simultaneously. According to MacNeil, the state's involvement in arranging marriages, the financial exchange, and the basis of the contest are all more indicative of a Greek context than a Mesopotamian one. Reflecting specifically the competitive world of the tiny city-state, suspicious of outsiders, protective of its women, and intent upon accomplishing social policy at the expense of individual freedoms, coined money is used to facilitate commercial transactions in a functioning oral society. The marriage market may also reflect a particular Greek approach to social justice, according to the assumption that the state can play an active role for the community's good. Herodotus asserts that Babylon doesn't have any doctors, which was presumably relatively backward to a Greek audience. However, he was incorrect. The Hippocratic corpus itself drew heavily on Babylonian medicine, but Herodotus was unaware of the extent of the debt. Herodotus also describes an unauthentic Babylonian custom involving bringing the sick into the streets to be counselled by passers-by. The Babylonian custom of bringing the sick out into the street to receive advice from passers-by is another inauthentic custom described by Herodotus. The last Babylonian custom described by Herodotus is ritual prostitution in the temple of Aphrodite, something he asserts every woman should perform at least once in her lifetime. Herodotus offers his own straightforward judgment on Babylon at the beginning of his description. It is the most beautiful city in all the known worlds. He describes it as the one custom amongst these people that is wholly shameful, regardless of whether he approves of the other practices he describes. Although likely to later be conflated with the biblical whore of Babylon and the image of the city of sin, these traditions developed independently and for different reasons. As for the biblical case, Nebuchadnezzar's behavior toward Jerusalem explains it. Herodotus and other Greek sources attribute it to grudge. Another huge factor is a fascination with the exotic and using the Far East both as a theme for fantasy and as a measure of the merits of Greek culture. Of course, the interest here was not always parochial or malicious, but it was hardly an ideal beginning to understanding cultures. Theseus Theseus of Nidus, a doctor of the Persian court, also wrote a long description of Babylon. He appears in the epitomes of Diodorus Siculus and Photius, even though his Persica in 23 books did not survive. His description of Babylon is included in the former. As Diodorus cites Theseus throughout this description, he is also known to have borrowed whole passages from Megasthenes and Agatharchides. Rather than providing a strictly personal account, his intention in writing the Bibliotheque Historica was to synthesize historical knowledge. Diodorus seems to have copied portions of Theseus' description of Babylon verbatim, or nearly verbatim. Diodorus' description of Babylon primarily draws on Theseus, according to current scholarship on him. Murphy is keen to emphasize that Diodorus does not deserve the charge of being an uncritical compiler and plagiarizer of earlier works, to which he added nothing of his own, no insights, no grand unifying themes, in his introduction to Book Two of the Library Historica. The references to the description of Theseus mostly agree with Diodorus' account, though one crucial addition is the Hanging Gardens. Budge argued that Diodorus did not quote this part of that description from Theseus, although it is unclear on what basis. Theseus is occasionally referred to in the Diodorus text, acting as occasional reminders rather than specific citations that Theseus is the authority. Even though Theseus' apparent tendency to distrust Herodotus is evident, one commentator points out that Theseus tends to disagree with Herodotus whether or not he has better information. For example, 
in the case of Darius's fellow conspirators against pseudo Smyrdis. Herodotus gives five names out of six, while Titius provides only one. Much of the content of the description, as known from Diodorus, claims to have drawn from Archimenid archives. However, oral tradition and stories heard at the Persian court seem more probable sources. The editors of the Persica observe in their introduction that Titius was writing something different from Herodotus. The Persica is a very original work that is based on a combination of observation and the rich oral tradition of the Persian court, as well as a healthy dose of Greek curiosity about their eastern neighbours. Diodorus Titius begins his history with Ninus, the first king of Asia and founder of the city of Ninus, Nineveh, who undertook the task of subduing the nations of Asia within 17 years, except for the Indians and Bactrians. Minus conquests are listed next, starting in Egypt and ending in Iran and Central Asia. Much of Tisius' account feels like a mythological origin story, but this list suggests that this is not a genuinely ancient kingdom. Still, one of the great empires of the first millennium BC, the picture is more representative of the entire Archaemenid Empire than of a conqueror's work. But even a significantly reduced version, such as that caused by the Neo-Assyrian expansion, would describe an empire that had not yet been built before the 9th century BC. In Tisius' description of the founding of Nineveh, which has been inhabited since the 7th millennium BC, or of the first empire in Asia, which archaeologists may associate with the kings of Akkad, the mythological components of the narrative encourage the error of referring to great antiquity. The city's actual age could not have been realised by Tisius, and he could have been referring to later imperial building work in any Assyrian capital. He is probably trying to explain the origins of the Assyrian Empire. According to the idea that empires succeeding one another in Asia inherited one another's territory, its provinces resembled those of the contemporary Persian Empire. Ninus, Nineveh, founded by the king Ninus, is described by Tisius as the largest city at the time of its foundation and the largest city ever built. These characteristics were more fitting for Babylon, since Nineveh was on the Tigris and Babylon was larger. At least in the author's mind, the city described is not Babylon, as the founding of that city by Semiramis is subsequently related, and later events set in Nineveh clearly point to that city as an intended destination. The identification of Babylon in the account is also suspect, since some of the palace decoration described by Diodorus, is very similar to that featured in Assyrian palace reliefs. However, although the scene depicted is reminiscent of an Assyrian relief, the rest of the description could only apply to Babylon, as the glazed brick comforts are unmistakably those of Nebuchadnezzar. The bricks were adorned with depictions of wild animals before they were fired, and the ingenuity of the colours faithfully reflected reality, as Tisius noted, all kinds of wild animals had been depicted on them before they were fired. In this case, Babylon is at least implicitly mentioned, and it is not impossible that even the description of the subject matter is roughly accurate and that we are missing images of the king hunting that once existed in the city. While excavating the Persian building, Calderway felt he had found a match for the hunting scene description. There is also the possibility that the two cities have been conflated, much in the way Nineveh appears here on the Euphrates. Both were, after all, part of the massive imperial architecture of Persia in which Tisius lived. Ninus is a vital founder, but Tisius, or at least Diodorus, devotes time to Semiramis, a detailed account of her life and marriage to Ninus, her succession to the throne after Ninus' death, the founding of Babylon, her achievements as sole sovereign, the decadence of her descendants, and the fall of Nineveh under Sardanapalus. To Arabases the Mede are included. It is only in the life of Semiramis, daughter of Derceto, founder of Babylon, and warrior queen, described in Tisius' account, 
In Herodotus, Herodotus only notes that she was responsible for indeed remarkable embankments in the plain outside the city, Babylon, a canal built to control the river that flooded the whole region, a description that fits well with Strabo's observation of a folk tradition identifying Semiramis as a great builder found throughout Western Asia, rather than describing the works of Nitocris. It is thought that she was based on the queen of Sennacherib, known as Zakutu and Nakia, who rose to power as the mother of Esarhaddon during his reign. She is shown on a relief behind the king building palaces and appears directly involved in her day's religious and military affairs. Several aspects of Semiramis have been attributed to her in later legends. A few verses into Titius' account, Semiramis is described as waging war disguised as a male soldier and proving herself a great military strategist. She succeeds Ninus in campaigns in Ethiopia and India, as Alexander did. She is forced to deal with an army of war elephants in the latter. She is also described as bloodthirsty by Tesius, choosing soldiers from her army to sleep with before having them executed the following day to avoid the risk of having to share or cede her power to her husband. Her transformation into a dove is complete. The Semiramis biography was initially written by Tesius, as confirmed by Athenagoras, for if detestable and God-hated men were regarded as gods, then Semiramis, a lascivious and blood-stained woman, was revered as a Syrian goddess. According to Tesius, the Syrians worshipped doves and Semiramis due to Derceto, since, despite all the odds, a woman was transformed into a dove. So what wonder if some should be called gods by their people on account of their rule and sovereignty, and others for their power? Those known for their art, such as Asclepius, and others as Heracles and Perseus. In Ovid's Metamorphoses, the transformation of Semiramis into a dove is understood via a casual allusion to the myth. Curiously, this apparently ideal tale is not told. Ovid's main Babylonian story is the tragic love story between Pyramus and Thisbe. There is no doubt that Semiramis' deeds are connected to historical events in Mesopotamia, but the relationship is highly complex and tangled. Semiramis has long been thought to derive from Samuramat, an Assyrian queen, enabling us to reconcile a Neo-Assyrian queen with Babylon's builder. Time and place are out of congruence with the historical character of Samaramat. But this can be explained in part by the phenomena already discussed, namely the confluence of Nineveh and Babylon, and the lack of understanding of the distance in time between the foundations of either Nineveh or Babylon and the rise of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The career of Samaramat was also remarkable. She was a queen of Shamshi Adad V, 823-811 BC, but appeared to have acted as vice-regent or co-regent under her son, Adad-Nirari III, 810-783, and even went to war with him. However, the etymological link between Semiramis and Samaramat has been questioned, and a Syrian deity as an alternative suggestion has been proposed. Tesius himself refers to the existing Syrian tradition of deifying Semiramis by worshipping a dove. Herodotus and Tesius Semiramises are thus rendered as historical characters and not as historical characters infused with mythology or divinity. Semiramis' detailed biography is followed by Diodorus' account of the decadence, sloth and luxury of the Assyrian kings, exemplified by Ninias, Semiramis' son, Sardanapalus, her last descendant, there are no records of other rulers except Teutamos, who was said to have sent reinforcements to the Trojans under the command of Memnon. Tesius Diodorus remarks, there is no urgency to record all the king's names and reigns, since they haven't done anything noteworthy. As the example of Assyrian kingship, Ninias is presented as follows. The son of Semiramis and Ninus, Ninias succeeded to the throne after Semiramis died, 
ruling peacefully and not emulating his mother's love of war and her adventurous spirit, he sought luxury, idleness, and the absence of suffering and anxiety, thinking that the goal of a happy reign was to enjoy all types of pleasures without constraint. First of all, he spent all his time alone in the palace, seeing no one except his concubines and attendant eunuchs. As a result, Semiramis appears heroic compared to her son. Even the love of war is viewed as a virtue. Ninius' faults are also found in Persian kings, as Greek writers recognize. Decadence, luxury, softness, and retreat from contact with the world outside the palace, especially during war. Clearly the palace culture of the ancient Middle East contributed to this impression among Greek writers, but it also served to highlight the Greek values of austerity and the public forum by condemning Oriental corruption. Ninias is a type of government that engenders and reinforces the traits of individuals not fit for leadership, in the same spirit as Aeschylus Persians. The environment, they suggest, creates and strengthens the characteristics of individuals not suited to government. Sardanapalus shows the result of such decadent hedonism, carried on for many generations. Byron's famous 1821 play of the same name provided the inspiration for the Sardanapalus familiar in modernity and is an excellent example of the original template for the modern literary and artistic trope of the Oriental despot. Sardanapalus, the later Syrian king, and the thirteenth in succession after Ninus, who founded the empire, was more luxurious and idle than any other Assyrian king who had come before him. Apart from the fact that he was never seen outside the palace, he lived the life of a woman and spent time with his concubines, spinning purple cloth and working the softest fleeces, and he wore female clothing, and dressed with white lead and other things courtesans typically use, in a way more delicate than any luxury-loving woman could. As a result, he purposefully adopted a woman's voice, and on top of that, he pursued the pleasures of sex with both men and women during his drinking sessions without any thought of the shame that might involve it. Quite differently, the fall of Assyria was given a moral dimension comparable to that of the punishment of Nineveh and Babylon, described in the Old Testament. Despite the tendency to decadence, Sardanapalus' defeat was not presented as inevitable. After successfully defending Ninus, Nineveh, against several attacks, Sardanapalus let his guard down too soon, unaware that a Bactrian army was on its way to support him. During the feast, he distributes good food and wine to his soldiers, upon which everyone begins to carouse. In the night, Arabasi's army surprises them. Sardanapalus retreats into Nineveh, powerless as garrisons from across the empire defect one by one to the rebels' side. However, the city walls and stores could withstand a two-year siege even today. In the third year, however, great storms of rain swept the land without ceasing, resulting in the Euphrates becoming flooded, inundating parts of the city and overturning the wall. Seeing that all is lost, Sardanapalus builds the famous pyre containing his wealth, royal robes, concubines and eunuchs and consigns himself to the flames along with them all and the palace itself. While Tisius is credited as the first to write about Sardanapalus in Greek, there is evidence that he was not the first to describe him. The Hellenicus of Lesbos fragment mentions the existence of stories on Sardanapalus that portray him sometimes as a hero, sometimes as decadent and weak, and rationalizes the two by evoking two Assyrian kings by the same name. What were stories available to Tisius? Sardanapalus was who? Ashurbanipal. Ashurbani Apli is the name of the city itself. In the 19th and early 20th century, Assyriology regarded Greek and Assyrian words and characters as synonymous. Recent research has suggested that the name may be a combination of two Assyrian kings, Ashurbanipal and Esarhaddon. 
In the case of the Aramaic papyrus containing the story of Ashurbanipal and Shamash Shuma Ukin's civil war of the 4th century BC, see chapter 2, Ashurbanipal indeed becomes Sardanapal. In many ways, the conflict between the brothers is a reversal of the story told by Tisius of Sardanapalus. As in life, it is Shamash Shuma Ukin who finds himself under siege here. Like Sardanapalus, he barricaded himself in his palace at Babylon, not Nineveh, and later died, though not in flames, by accident while attempting to march on Nineveh. Due to similarities between the two accounts and the existence of an Aramaic account, it seems likely that the story was widely dispersed. Tisius Sardanapalus may indeed echo the war between Ashurbanipal and Shamash Shuma Ukin. The story moves away from Babylon, and the last kings of Assyria, after the great Ashurbanipal, are forgotten, with one king's name preserved, but the fate of the other forgotten. Shamash Shuma Ukin's grisly end at Babylon can be recycled as the fall of Nineveh. What about translation and language? Tisius could not have possessed the skills of a classically trained Babylonian scribe, that is, knowledge of Assyrian and Babylonian, the two main dialects of the Akkadian language. By extension, several huge cuneiform sign sets are also part of Sumerian. The verse accounts of Nabonidus, a priestly account in Babylonian emphasizing the king's neglect of his people and city, was not available to him. It is more likely that Babylonian literary traditions were accessed indirectly. Taking note of Babylonian elements in Tisius' account of the destruction of Nineveh, van der Meerup concludes that it is probable that Tisius used a Babylonian source to describe the destruction of Nineveh and concludes that, unbeknownst to Tisius, this source was supposedly based on Assyrian accounts of Sennacherib's sacking of Babylon in 689 BC and was written to emphasize retribution. Although these links are convincing, they do not exclude transmission by intermediate oral sources. In light of the discovery that Aramaic was the lingua franca of the Archaeomenid Empire, spoken Aramaic has been grossly overlooked as a source for Tisius' account. Daly discusses the implications of this point, which opens up a range of new possibilities. Daly argues that Tisius' history, with its geographical and historical confusion, can partly be explained by the flexibility of the historical setting in Aramaic, Tales of Kings. Examples of similar accounts are presented below. Aramaic has likely written and oral sources from the missing connection in many more cases than we can prove in terms of transmission, especially in explaining the survival of names and fragments of history from the cuneiform world in otherwise very distant sources. A story about Ahikar the sage provides more evidence of this corruption. A papyrus that describes the war between Ashurbanipal and Shamashuma Ukin is another example. We could certainly better understand ancient Mesopotamian history if we had access to such sources. The loss of these sources is not the only one we should mourn. Would the picture be different if one text had survived above all? For a non-Babylonian seeking knowledge of the land and its people, Berossus was undoubtedly the definitive guide. Berossus A wealth of information about Babylon is provided by Tisius and Herodotus, some of it accurate and all of it enjoyable. However, neither of these extended accounts was written by a member of the society they purported to describe. An equivalent account by a Greek visitor did not survive. When cuneiform texts were still known and understood, although Aramaic had long been the spoken language in most of Western Asia, Berossus wrote a history of Babylonia in Greek, known as Babylonica or Chaldaica. Cuneiform provided him with direct access to more information than any Greek writer could hope to have. As he was native to the society he wrote about, 
Josephus' description of the Babylonica suggests Berossus' history predated the legendary world of Atrahasis. The Neo-Babylonian kings are described as follows. The witness I cite here is Berossus, a Chaldean by birth but a familiar figure in learned circles for publishing works on Chaldean astronomy and philosophy for Greek readers. As Moses did, this author, following the most ancient records, describes the flood and the destruction of mankind thereby, as well as the ark in which Noah, the founder of our race, was saved after it landed on the heights of the mountains of Armenia. He then enumerates Noah's descendants, adding dates, and descends to Nabopolassa, king of Babylon and Chaldea. Sadly, little of the work has survived. According to some scholars, Barossus's history was eventually forgotten because it did not fit well with the existing dominant account of Mesopotamian history, that of Theseus, which omitted vital figures such as Ninus and Semiramis. Flavius Josephus and Eusebius of Caesarea are the only later writers cited or quoted the account. However, even these fragments contain a great deal of valuable information, and it is clear that Berossus had an accurate record of the Neo-Babylonian succession, including the lengths of each king's reign, that could only have come from Babylonian chronicles. Where Berossus' account in classical literature survives, it is usually altered and mythologized. In what is likely a garbled account of an original with some Babylonian roots, Berossus describes a festival called Sakaya, in which enslaved people rule their masters for five days. In Plutarch, the idea is revived. Semiramis convinces Ninus to give her power for five days before she uses it to imprison him. In his book, Diodorus attributes the story to Athenius and certain other historians, but does not mention Berossus as the origin. History Against the Pagans, one of the most widely read and influential historical texts of medieval Europe, was further embellished in the 5th century AD by Paulus Orosius. As well as providing more detailed description of Semiramis' depravity, Orosius adds a mystical numerological link with Rome, which is distinctively Christian. The corrupted source raises questions about the original content of Berossus, particularly regarding its chronology. It is safe to say that all of the lists of Neo-Babylonian monarchs that have survived, Berossus' arrangement most closely resembles the cuneiform documents. However, we only know his arrangement through Josephus and Eusebius' apparent quotations of the same passage in Berossus. In addition, Eusebius preserves Alexander Polyhistor's list who also claimed that Barossus was his source and provided a different version of events. Josephus claims to quote Barossus directly for the first time, and his account is so strikingly accurate in the details that can be checked against the cuneiform sources to make those that cannot be verified all the more tantalizing. Barossus adds details about murder and conspiracy, not found in the terse Mesopotamian royal chronicles, to the names and reigns of the Neo-Babylonian king. The kingdom passed to his son, Evil Merodach, Amel Marduk. When Nabuchodonosor, Nebuchadnezzar, fell ill and died after a reign of 43 years. After two years in power, the prince was assassinated by the sister's husband, Neriglissar. Because of his arbitrary and licentious government, his murderer, Neriglissar, became king after his death and reigned for four years. It was occupied for nine months by Labaro Sordok, Labashi Marduk, a boy, but a conspiracy was formed against him because of his depraved disposition, and he was beaten to death by his friends. Nabonidus, Nabonidus, a Babylonian and a member of the conspirators, was conferred the kingdom after his murder by their common consent. Barossus adds a human dimension to the known Babylonian historical texts through the plots. Against Amal Marduk and Labashi Marduk. However, 
The absence of this information in the cuneiform sources should raise a red flag. Are the details of the murders based on an oral tradition or through written sources now lost, but obviously of a very different kind than the official records from which the regnal years were obtained? Or are they simply creative additions to suit the Greek style of historiography and a Greek audience? Which begs the further question whether the details necessarily come from Berossus himself or from a later redactor. As a result, we should still take Berossus' account of Babylon's conquest and the fate of Nabonidus seriously, since it fleshes out the information from the cuneiform sources. Cyrus led a large army from Persia to Babylon to subjugate the rest of the kingdom during the 17th year of Nabonidus' reign. The day Nabonidus heard about him, he led his army to meet him, fought and lost, then fled to Borsippa with a few followers. After raising all the city's outer walls as it had an awe-inspiring and formidable appearance, Cyrus took Babylon and proceeded to Borsippa to besiege Nabonidus. Having surrendered without investment, he was treated humanely. He was sent to Carmania after being expelled from Babylonia. After spending most of his life there, Nabonidus died there. The Hanging Gardens, Berossus and Amiitis The Hanging Gardens were primarily influenced by Berossus. He seems to credit Nebuchadnezzar with their construction, and there seems to be less confusion in his account of Babylon and Nineveh than in those of Titius of Strabo. It raises some doubt that we know Berossus through Jewish and Christian writers since Nebuchadnezzar became regarded as a generic king of Babylon in a later tradition. But the correspondence to what is known of his life seems too good to be a coincidence. Berossus sets out to refute the Greek belief that Semiramis was responsible for Babylon's architectural marvels. And it is in this context that he gives one of the most apparent indications that he is working with Babylonian sources an account of Nebuchadnezzar's construction work at Babylon that both finds confirmation in the cuneiform sources and can be persuasively matched with a particular text. Robert van der Speck has drawn strong parallels between the East India House inscription of Nebuchadnezzar and Barossus' description of the city, displaying that Barossus describes the same works in the same order as the monumental stone inscription in the British Museum. It is remarkable how closely the two texts correspond, with one notable exception, the description of the Hanging Gardens. Berossus mentions the gardens even though no cuneiform source says them, and this description is based on a known Babylonian inscription. Berossus' mention of the gardens should be considered significant, given his accuracy on other points. Why might they be mentioned? Within this palace, Nebuchadnezzar built elevated stone terraces, which are thought to have closely replicated mountain scenery, complete with all kinds of trees and a hanging garden, because his wife, who grew up in Media, had a passion for mountain scenery. Berossus ties this description to a specific king and a particular place. Nebuchadnezzar's southern palace by incorporating it within a narrative of Nebuchadnezzar's building works. Based on this and other classical sources, attempts have been made to locate the palace gardens. Robert Coldewey's candidate, the so-called vaulted building, and the recent proposal of the great western outwork between palace and river, previously interpreted as a fortified keep or treasury, as a possible location. However, it is worth contemplating that the addition of the gardens might have been made by another author. The Greek audience would then be more likely to accept Berossus. Nebuchadnezzar's mountain-loving bride may hold the key to the story's origin. Berossus was the first author to identify Nebuchadnezzar as the monarch who built Babylon's gardens and gave Amiitis the name of his queen. However, Little attention has been paid to the fact that he makes these identifications in two different sections of his narrative. Amiitis is a political marriage that he mentions due to her illness. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon's crown prince, marries Amiitis. 
daughter of Astyges, and granddaughter of Cyaxares, to form a Babylonian-Mediterranean alliance. The story's first rationalizer of the Iranian origin of the queen is Berossus, but he does so in a separate, unromantic description of the rising Neo-Babylonian dynasty. Therefore, it is doubtful that the marriage was invented by Berossus, or a later editor, to correspond with his description of the gardens, in which he neither names Amiitis nor mentions the other passage. It does, however, match perfectly with the report. Queen Berossus comes from Media, whose capital is Ekbatana, high in the Zagros Mountains. In all versions, the queen moves from a mountainous country, Persia in Diodorus, unnamed in Curtius, to a flat one. Media, Ekbatana, modern Hamadan, has peaks of over 3,000 metres and one of the most balanced landscapes on earth. Babylonia presented the most significant contrast in the entire region. We can draw several conclusions from this. First of all, did it make sense to create a romantic hanging gardens story centred around Media and Barossa's queen? Nebuchadnezzar's marriage is described in a far more matter-of-fact manner, at least a remarkable coincidence, since both appear in the text for a different reason and seem entirely independent of one another. Even the earliest of the later redactors would find it difficult to introduce these two details. Considering that neither appears in an earlier Greek source, their use implies knowledge of the landscape of Media and the political situation, unknown to the Greeks, of the Babylonian Median alliance against Assyria. Third, the identification author criticizes elsewhere the tendency to confuse Babylon with Nineveh, as in the case of Semiramis, and gives a highly credible political explanation for why they were married. Assyrian king Nebuchadnezzar is, of course, not confused with him. Fourth, if the tale is romantic about Nebuchadnezzar and his Persian wife, even the pre Berossus version demonstrates some connection to Nebuchadnezzar's life. Berossus is aware of the story, but his treatment implies that it is not a product of the Babylonian official sources, as it shouldn't be. An Iranian court origin for the story would appear much more plausible than a 4th century Greek invention due to the combination of a narrative that incorporates myths and storytelling elements and knowledge of Babylon's political events and a folkloric interest in the contrast between Iranian and Babylonian landscapes. This confirms Theseus's claim that the story originated in the Persian court Diodorus' account of the Hanging Gardens was likely based on the court stories of Clitarchus, who had uninterrupted access to them. This conclusion seems more than a coincidence that the sadly minimal evidence for old Persian literature suggests a perfect fit. Stories that are thought to have their origin in the Greek sources and the Shaname are notable for their innovation of romantic tales that involve journeys to faraway lands. There is no description of the gardens themselves. The classical sources describe their construction and engineering in spurious detail. Although they have some similarities to Sennacherib's parks at Nineveh, they are probably best explained as Greek embellishments. Berossus' account of them is conspicuously lacking in them. Combined, the collection suggests a Median or Persian oral tradition that originated at a time when Nebuchadnezzar's marriage to a Median princess was still widely known. The Persian court tradition survived, with an appropriate Persian princess as a substitute. By the time they reached Theseus, the identities of king and queen may have been lost even if they hadn't been before. It is doubtful that Theseus had any knowledge of Babylonian history that would have enabled him to place these individuals in context. Berossus was aware of both versions of the story. Romances and Novels Babylon appears to be quite different from the histories described above in two fragmentary early novels, Iamblichus Babyloniaca and Ninus Romance. Four papyrus fragments survive from an early 1st century AD Greek novel called Ninus Romance. Two possibilities for authorship are Chariton, author of the book Kaleho, and citizen of Aphrodisias, formerly known as Nino, Ninus, and Xenophon of Antioch, 
whose Babylonica is mentioned in the Suda, a lexical encyclopedic volume, dating to the 10th century AD. As a matter of style and format, the novel does not seem to borrow from Mesopotamian sources and does not appear to make an attempt to exhibit the differences of another culture. Despite the plot's unusual nature and its origin in Hellenized and mythologized Mesopotamian history, McCall is suitable to describe the names Ninus and Semiramis as merely historical ciphers in a romantic plot that involves a shipwreck, warfare, and love scenes. Neither the protagonists nor their behavior can be identified as historical figures in ancient Iraq or Greek historical figures. The use of historical allegory by Ninus does, however, provide us with an interesting case study. In this literary form, two interesting points are the selection of some, but not all, historical information and the role of barbarian historical ciphers, such as Ninus and Semiramis. In terms of historical evidence, Tessius Persica is the most likely source for Ninus, while Herodotus' Babylon description is more ancient and mentions Ninus and Semiramis. It does not connect the two characters, does not mention Derceto, Semiramis' mother, according to Tessius Diodorus, and evidently in Ninus, and does not include descriptions of Assyrian campaigns, which we know from Diodorus were present in Tesius, and likely inspired Ninus' movement in Armenia in the Ninus Romance. The writer was aware of Tesius' narrative, but they were also willing to disregard and contradict it as readily as they borrowed from it. Ninus' beloved unnamed in the fragments is perhaps the most fascinating character, it is doubtful that Ninus' female protagonist is not Semiramis, as she is the wife of Ninus and the daughter of Derceto. Then we must explain the metamorphosis Semiramis underwent between her incarnations in Persica and Ninus. It portrays her as a fearsome warrior who rules alone, sleeps with her soldiers, executes them, and leads an ambitious military expedition to India. According to some accounts, Semiramis not only survives Ninus, but also tricks him out of his sovereignty. Tesius would not have needed to tell the author that Semiramis was a brave and warlike figure. This is probably canonical and widely known. By contrast, the characters in the Ninus romance is too shy to reveal her feelings for Ninus to his mother, while Ninus' parallel speech to Derkea is an essential stylistic element. Though the novel, as we know it, is fragmentary, and there is certainly the possibility that Semiramis performed more boldly in lost portions of the story, this incident alone departs entirely from the portrait available to the Ninus author from historical sources. In this context, we can conclude that the writer deliberately chose to leave historical accuracy as he considered the representation of an ideal character more critical than preserving historical accuracy. There is even less resemblance between the Babylonica of Iamblichos, preserved by only an epitome in the Bibliotheque of Photius. According to Stevens and Winkler, Photius describes the plot in detail. If the patriarch could pull our leg, this would be the place to test that suspicion. He says the hero and heroine are chased throughout the Near East by two eunuchs whose noses and ears have been removed. Bees with poisoned honey a lesbian princess of Egypt, a cannibalistic brigand, look-alike brothers named Tigris and Euphrates, who are doubly handsome, as well as a rather dignified farmer's daughter, whom the heroine forces to sleep with, an executioner, who is really a priest of Aphrodite, who helps his son, the Euphrates, break out of jail by dressing as the farmer's daughter. It seems that Iamblichos' own identity has been mythologized to some degree. The Suda claims he was born a servant, but Photius claims Iamblichos learned the story of the Babylonica from a Babylonian servant. However, the truth may be that both efforts are to add some extra interest to the story through its exotic origin. Pyramus and Thisbe are the most famous of the classical romances set in Babylon, though their original setting is largely forgotten today. The Story 
In Ovid's Metamorphoses, Pyramus, the most handsome man in the East, and Thisbe, the most beautiful woman, lived next to one another in Babylon, the city Semiramis had founded. A brick wall surrounds the area. A crack in the wall between their two homes allows the lovers to communicate, despite being separated by their parents. But they cannot kiss, so they arrange to meet near Nina's tomb by a tall mulberry tree. A passing lion frightens Thisbe away, despite being the first to arrive. Luckily, the lion just ate. When Pyramus sees his beloved's cloak, dropped during her escape, chewed by the lion, and stained with blood from its earlier kill, he is naturally devastated. His belief in Thisbe's death leads him to impale himself on his own sword. Pyramus' body has been discovered, and Thisbe is racked with grief. She uses Pyramus' still warm blade to end her life. Her last words are a prayer that the two lovers may lie together in death, and that the mulberry, which has been white until this day, may remember their deaths in the crimson colour of its berries. Shakespeare's rude mechanicals are best known for performing the story in A Midsummer Night's Dream. In Romeo and Juliet, Ovid's Babylonian Pyramus and Thisbe are more than an echo of the tragedy and drama of Romeo and Juliet. There is a dual inheritance. Biblical and ancient Greek historical traditions are sharply different in their treatment of Babylon, in terms of specifics, and their attitudes toward Mesopotamia. There are almost ethnographic accounts of Babylonian culture in Greek historians' works, but the Old Testament is richer in moral allegory, asserting a providential meaning for Babylon's past that has defined the city's culture ever since. It is not primarily a matter of information availability, but purpose and situation. In the biblical texts, a familiar land and culture are woven into a story about divine judgment. In the Greek accounts, a land and culture are described as unfamiliar to their readers. Greek sources emphasize detail over moral judgment, resulting in a quasi-ethnographic resource that historians later drew from and adapted. For the biblical descriptions, the point is a righteous judgment, not a report. In any case, Jewish and Christian morality is primarily found in the Bible, rather than in pagan histories or ancient Greek legends. Over time, a clear distinction would emerge in how the two categories of sources are employed, with classical sources having a more significant influence on academic reconstructions of Babylon and cultural detail in visual representations. In contrast, biblical accounts have a more substantial impact on the moral graphics of Babylon and the selection of subjects in art and literature. However, the two traditions would not be treated in isolation from each other, and sometimes strenuous efforts would be made to reconcile and integrate the two. Therefore, it is not surprising that by late antiquity the biblical and classical accounts provided all the information available on Babylon and indeed, all that will be available for many centuries to come. The ancient city itself had disappeared as well as the vast cuneiform literature of Babylon and the expertise necessary to read it. Would medieval scholars be able to interpret what remained? And how would those Europeans who saw Mesopotamia's ancient ruins interpret them? They would always refer to Baghdad as the city of incredible ruins, Babylon offered only the vast, almost featureless mounds beneath which Nebuchadnezzar's city lay hidden and upon which layers of folklore and legend would continue to accumulate. You have been listening to Ancient Anunnaki and the Babylonian Empire How the Sumerians' Legends Descended to the Reign of Nebuchadnezzar Written by Farouk Zamani